Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode. This is a special episode, a nice collaboration between us here at History of Westeros and Daniele and his team over at History on Fire. And, you know, he's going to call it I Drink and I Know Things, but I think we're going to call it History on Blood and Fire, because, you know, that's a more Game of Thronesy name. That's how we do it. It's one of the great things about the podcast community that it's just really easy to collaborate with other people. The technology is simplified enough, and, you know, if you have a good back and forth with another podcaster, it can turn into something cool. So I hope you enjoy this. This episode is brought to you in large part thanks to our patrons, including Jeff Gnarly, the long snapper, History of Westeros' first sword, and of course our dragon riders, Lord Mark of House Joseph, the snow at Winterfell, rider of Mazla Cartho, a white dragon with green scales, horns, wings, and talons, Telenis the Talon, King of Gagasos, rider of Telerius, a red dragon with scales, horns, and talons of midnight black, and Jinx of House Lier, green queen of the Rainwood, rider of Erogenia, sylphic albino dragon with amethyst eyes and opalescent wings. Thanks, y'all. Also thanks to Studio Headphones, Studio Sweden offers a variety of great headphones, many of which we've used and enjoyed. I enjoy both their Studio Regent and Studio Tray models, over the ear and fit in the ear types. If you go to historyofwestros.com and click on the link there, you can get yourself to Studio Sweden. Get 15% off by using the code Westeros. So ready for this episode. Uh, since this is a cooperative episode, we are going to do a little bit of introduction since uh, you, those of you guys listening to History on Fire may know me, but not Aziz and vice versa regarding History of Westeros. So let's jump in. Aziz, the ball is yours. Please introduce right. yourself. Thanks, Daniele. This is a great uh, podcast that I'm excited for us to do together. It was a great idea. And of course, it has a lot of a lot of fun things to talk about. My name is Daniele said is Aziz. I've been a podcaster for about five years and I cover both the books and show for Game of Thrones, a.k.a. A Song of Ice and Fire. And I have a huge love of history myself. And Game of Thrones is full of real historical references and real historical feeling and things like that mixed in with all the dragons and ice zombies, etc. So I'm really excited for this episode. And uh, Danielle, why don't you introduce yourself to the History of Westeros listeners who are maybe less familiar with you. I know a lot of my listeners do know you because I've talked about your show several times. So, but for people who don't know, thank, let's hear it. Thank you very much, Aziz. My name is Daniele Bolelli. I have a horrible Italian accent. Sorry about that. But I'm told that usually within 15, 20 minutes, people get used to it and they will able to take it. I run the History on Fire podcast where every month I cover some topic that is epic, larger than life, that has a Game of Thrones type of feel, except is real history. That is the gig. So today we're going to play together and let's see what we come up with. Yeah. Uh, one quick note of warning. This episode is definitely not for kids. So I know some of you listen to the podcast with your kids. Well, you know your kids better than I do, I'm sure. But the point is some of the themes that we're going to be playing with today are heavy. There hmm. are some fairly horrible stories we're going to be telling. Also, even if you don't have kids and you have nothing to do with it, if you're about to go on an important date you may want to postpone listening until afterwards because this is not going to put you in the mood. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so fair warning, just so you guys know. Um, having said that, let's jump into what this episode is going to be about. You know, few things have captured the popular imagination like the TV series Game of Thrones and, of course, the associated books by George R. R. Martin on which the series is based. It happens to me, I'm fairly sure it happens to other people. Sometimes when watching or reading Game of Thrones, it happens fairly often that we walk away thinking that R.R. Martin is just a sick bastard. Because some of the tales of his characters, you know, what his characters do to each other, sometimes they ring so evil that we have to imagine that real human beings wouldn't act this way if we want to feel better about human nature. Unfortunately, that is simply not true. Yeah, it's not true. One of the things that we learned while making this episode is by comparing Game of Thrones to history. Quite often, history is worse. It's more <laughs> evil. It's yeah. more dirty and dangerous. And that's 
echoed in George R. R. Martin's own thoughts. I mean, he does have, you may say, an odd passion for focusing on some of the most messed up aspects of humanity yeah, and of some of the worst things say. that we do. <laughs> yeah, very yeah. safe to say. But it's also realistic. He's not just being horrible to be horrible. He's saying this is real and it's the past body of work of fiction and fantasy. That's where we've gotten the wrong idea. He's His take is... I wouldn't say accurate, but it's closer to reality in a lot of ways and that how bad human nature can be. He once claimed that no matter how much I make up, there's stuff in history that's just as bad or worse. And he's so right. <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> so today we're going to play with a whole series of historical tales that either did or may have influenced the narrative of Game of Thrones. And there's a lot because George R. R. Martin is a big student of history. He has his own collection of medieval painted knights and figures and he loves castles and all this stuff it's very close to his heart and it's no wonder that he you know when he sat down to write something that it was in a setting like this and we won't be able to cover every comparison between game of thrones and history it's a massive massive topic and of course you know we don't even know in some cases where george got some of these inspirations in some cases we we may as, uh, ascribe historical influence when it's just something he came up with on his own that also happened in history yeah. in a lot of cases we do specifically know because he has been interviewed many times over the past 30 years or more about himself and about his books and things that he did before game of thrones and so we we get a good strong idea of where a lot of this comes from and there's a lot and as we sat down to make this episode, a lot of things changed. Of course, that's always how it goes with podcasting, especially when you're covering huge topics like this. Originally, we planned on having one of my co-hosts, Sean, with us, but that didn't work out. We originally planned on covering the Wars of the Roses. And at this point, we're probably not going to in this episode because there's just too much. By the way, we could just edit that out. If we do cover the Wars of the Roses, we'll just edit that little blast bit out. <laughs> Sound good. But... <laughs> that was my plan. They're like, well, I'll either cover it or we yeah. won't. We'll just stick a line in there or not. And of course, there's probably a lot of things that Danielle and I never thought of. Some of you listeners will probably write us after the fact and say, hey, what about this? And we'll we'll either say, well, we didn't have time for that. Or we'll say, hey, I didn't think of that one. That's a good one. That's a new one. So this is uh, not just a collaboration between us, but it's a collaboration with with you all, the audience, because I know you'll have some things that we missed. So to get started, George R. R. Martin himself has said on many occasions, and I've seen this myself in person, I've met him and I've, I've read and mm -hmm. listened to a lot of his interviews. He says that one of the oldest fantasy techniques is to, and we could call it a trope, is to take an existing real world idea and make it bigger, a lot bigger in some cases, and as a perfect example of that concept, we look at the continent of Westeros, which itself is really just either England made a lot larger and reversed 180 degrees, or perhaps instead of making it larger, stack England and Ireland on top of each other, or and then meh, move the wall around. There's, there's ways to make it work in different ways, and that's the thing. It's not a perfect one-to-one -one comparison. And Westeros being a larger version of England and or Ireland, it's not fantastical. You know, the continent itself is just earths and forests and rivers and mountains and desert all the normal stuff it's it's you know the westeros is is a, a low magic fantasy realm the, the magic is there but nothing about the the geography is particularly magical sure. except for one feature and it's the only man-made structure visible on either map which is in this case the north of england and in westeros we're talking about the north of westeros of course this is the wall and Hadrian's wall. Yes, indeed. Um, and George R. R. Martin in this has been uh, very clear that the Hadrian's wall was the inspiration for the wall of Game of Thrones. So not the Great Wall of China, not Trump's promised wall. Uh, Hadrian's wall is where it's at. Uh, Martin explicitly said so. It is a quote from of his that he said, the wall comes from Hadrian's wall which I saw while visiting Scotland. I stood on Adrian's wall and tried to imagine what it would be like to be a Roman soldier sent here from Italy or Antioch. To stand here, to gaze off into the distance, not knowing what might, what might emerge from the forest. Of course, fantasy is the stuff of bright colors and being larger than real life. So my wall is bigger and considerably longer and more magical. 
And of course, what lies beyond it has to be more than just Scots. So, you know, he's saying it right here. The, the inspiration is pretty clear, but the way then, you know, he played with it in such a way as to make it larger, scarier, both in terms of size, materials, and everything else. Yeah, and this is also a bit of how Game of Thrones originated, because the first scene he ever envisioned, the, the, the thing that came to his mind that inspired the whole series was similar to what Daniele just quoted, which is that he really liked this idea of soldiers guarding what, to them, their perception was that it was the end of the world. Mm -hmm. And of course, th just like J.R.R. Tolkien would say, the tale grew in the telling, but this was a key aspect. George started off with the idea to write a, a single book or a short story or a trilogy and now it's at least going to be seven books. So it keeps growing sort of like his wall did. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. The, um, let's just throw in a couple of historical informations regarding Adrian's Wall to see what we're talking about. Adrian's Wall, I'm imagining most of our listeners know this and understand this, but it was built by the Romans after they conquered Britannia. The wall was a large undertaking because it's about 73 miles long, cutting from the North Sea to the Irish Sea. Construction originally began around the year 122 Common Era, and it took six years to build. This was the very northern limit of the Roman Empire. You know, by 122, the Roman Empire was already very large by then, and there were rebellions everywhere. So one of the things that happened at this time is that Roman emperors were beginning to switch their thinking from expansion which is what had ruled the Roman Empire up until this point. You know, if you look at the map of Rome, it keeps stretching, 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 stretching. Well, by 122, not so much anymore. This is when they begin to think about focusing on defending what they already had, rather than constantly expanding, because they have probably reached the limit of what they could uh, conquer. So it seems that the wall was built in response to fighting with some of the local tribes. There are very few references to this in the historical record, by the way, but despite escaping the attention of historical chroniclers, some fragments give us clue that the conflict with some of the tribes in Scotland got on Hadrian's nerves, and he may have built the wall in response to it. A little more about the wall itself. It's uh, unlike the wall of Game of Thrones. This one is only 10 feet wide and 20 feet tall. So small. I know. So <laughs> think of it as a bonsai version of the Game of Thrones wall. You know, it's like, and also it's not made of ice. It uh, wasn't designed to keep giants and the undead out, just the pigs. So, really short-sighted of them, I got to say. Yeah, because you never know when the undead may show up. The, um, it featured, of course, watchtowers and some small forts located about one mile from one another. Much like the Game of Thrones wall, Adrian's wall was sometimes attacked by those it meant to keep out. And so there were garrisons along the wall that sometimes were sent north of the wall for missions among the wildlings, so to speak, to use the Game of Thrones terminology. You know, doing punitive raids and other things. Now, much like in Game of Thrones, the Night Watch, the people who are garrison in the wall, are this is made of the rejects of society. Adrian's Wall, not exactly the rejects of society, but it definitely was not manned by regular legionaries uh, who had to be Roman citizens. Rather, what you had were foreign auxiliary troops uh, manned in the wall. Yeah, and that is a similar parallel in a lot of ways especially in the modern version of the wall, the old, the wall used to be a place to go where you would, it was kind of a noble goal, but at, over time, like many institutions that kind of fell. Uh, also like the wall in Molestown, um, which is the nearby settlement that has prostitutes, there was a similar situation at Hadrian's wall. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe there was more going on than just prostitution. And you say as well, this is new to me, Daniel, as we were researching this, you, you told me that this isn't necessarily the wall wasn't all about defense. There were some other functions 
as well to it. So I thought that was really interesting. And then to me, that's very new. Yeah, because the reality is that nobody knows, as often is the case in history. You yeah. know, we have <laughs> a lot of wild speculation about it may have been something to regulate trade, not only just to keep the barbarian hordes out, as the Romans would have seen it, but also as a tool to regulate trade of what went in and out. There are, you know, all sort of uh, historians argue a lot about whether the primary purpose of the wall was defensive or something else. And the bottom line is that the evidence is just inconclusive. So, you know, we can spin around forever and we really don't know yet. That, yeah, that, and that's also true for so many other things that we're going to talk about. But, you know, that's just the that's just the history game as it yes. is. You know, you don't know things. And that's something I really love about George R. R. Martin's world as well. He applies that same human lack of answers to his world. You mm -hmm. don't get the answers. There's no one, there's no narrator to Game of Thrones telling yep. you what's really happening. Everything is told through the perspective of individual characters who have limited information, just like they would. Even his extended material where he offers histories of the his seven kingdoms the westeros and all that it's all told from the perspective of an in-world maester which is for people less familiar with game of thrones those are the basic the the students the college professor types of, of westeros so even they are um used in that sense so that's something that's really cool but getting back to the wall a good example of how the concept I introduced at the beginning, which is how George R. R. Martin and other fantasy writers take things and they just make them bigger and that makes them fantastical. But it's not just objects. Don't think just things like this wall. It's concepts, too. Mm -hmm. And especially the scale of time. Mm -hmm. The wall itself in the setting of Game of Thrones has existed for some 8,000 years. Now, in world, 8,000 years is a guess. People don't know. It's just a rough estimate, just like we have on a lot of these things in our world. So the scale, but still, that's a scale of time we can hardly conceive of outside of an academic setting. I mean, go back 8,000 years in our world and you're at 6,000 BC and there's hardly anything in terms of structures that mm -hmm. survive. You, yep. There's tools, there's settlements, there's things that have survived. There's ancient ancestors that we know of. They were clever people. They, they built tools, they had homes, they, had, they loved and lived and died, but they didn't build giant walls, especially ice walls. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Although maybe they would have if there were ice demons at 6000 BC. Who knows? <laughs> yeah, that would help, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> but the ice itself, that's yet another example of making things bigger. Bigger isn't, you know, doesn't apply. Ice isn't bigger. Mm -hmm. It's stone. No, and it's not more exotic in general, but it is more exotic as a building material. I mean, definitely in the real world, the only things you see made of ice are like fancy ice sculptures or, you know, things like that. Yeah. <laughs> so so I think that's uh, so it's a good good to as we move through this episode, I want to make sure that everyone's mind is open to what bigger means. It's, it's It applies in a number of different ways. In fact, a perfect example is the foes that this wall is meant to repel. You mentioned them already. The. We got things like giants. <laughs> giants are literally bigger, but the, yep. the the white walkers are not bigger, but they are bigger in a sense that they're more dangerous than, you know, wild picts and uh, other things like that. Things that humanity has to offer. But so that's uh, that's pretty huge. And um, the overwhelming power of the white walkers, I think, is what's bigger here. And uh, we have kind of yet to see how that's going to play out. But. We all know that they're powerful. <laughs> Definitely. We got that idea. So that's uh, one example of something that was clearly and obviously inspired by history, in this case, uh, ancient Roman history, and that um, George R. R. Martin used as a, in some way, you hinted at this earlier, but not just as a big feature of Game of Thrones, but in many ways as the starting point of Game of Thrones. Because yeah. initially what he said was, you know, he was just imagining what life would have been like for these people guarding the wall. And in some way, all of Game of Thrones then span from there. You know, he started, I would like to write a story about those guys, and then, uh, you know, slowly but surely add a little note here, a little note there. You have the whole of Westeros after that. But the original point, which is why we start with this specific example, even though there's really not a whole lot to say because we know relatively little about Adrian's Wall, it's important because it's the origin in many ways. Yeah. It's the origin point of Game of Thrones. So, And it speaks to what he had in mind 
which sticks to the principles of history really well. And what I mean by that is he didn't start with the ice wall and the, the others and the dragons and we'll go from there. He started with the humans yep. and then decided to add the dragon. In fact, the dragons were added fairly late in the game, actually, as it right. turns out. He had a, a friend convinced him to add dragons. And but the point of that is to is to take the human stories and see what they're what they're like in this extreme environment. It's not the story isn't about the dragons and the White Walkers. They are part of it. Definitely. They are the part that fuels the human stories within it. And that's what mo a lot of us look for in history is we look for these human stories amongst these giant forces of nature and politics and power and time. And uh, that's something that I, I think we li like to pull out as much as possible, but it's hard because so much of this doesn't survive. Mm -hmm. His history doesn't record a lot of these human stories. And I think that's, uh, I've used the line multiple times. I think I've used it on the podcast too, but to me, Game of Thrones is history with the dragons being an extra you know it's like if you remove the dragons then everything else looks and feels like history and that's hopefully what we're going to show you today how so much of this stuff has parallels in actual real history so speaking of which if we were to bring up things like the use of obsidian uh, abundance of human sacrifice cannibalism nature worship Depending on which of our podcasts you listen to, you know, if you listen to History on Fire, we would, you would recognize some of these themes emerging when we discuss the Mexica, also known as the Aztecs. If you listen to History of Westeros discussing those exact same specific topics, the children of the forest would come to mind. So let's look at how some of these things play out, both in history and in Game of Thrones. Why don't you tell us a little bit about the Game of Thrones part, and then I'll jump in with the history. Sounds good. And this, by the way, is one of the key aspects of this episode that makes it unsafe for children. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, I, and I don't mean children of the forest. <laughs> no, one of many. You know, we warm yeah. you up with the wall. That's very safe. It's <laughs> that like, was pretty safe. <laughs> but now, now is the point where you want to put your kids to bed. <laughs> Yeah, here comes the extreme violence that is present in both history and in fantasy. We are going to focus on the Mexica, but the, the children actually bear resemblances to many different Native American cultures. And of course, the Native American pastiche, uh, which in, when I say Native American, of course, I'm referring to North and South America. Yeah. These are a lot of times... These two, these are kind of amalgamated in the mind of people who don't know better, like myself. And listening to your podcast has really helped me make some of these things distinct, because um, you've done a lot of coverage of both Northern American natives and South American natives, and it's it's fascinating, and it's also really really bloody. But <laughs> <laughs> we'll get to that in a minute. So one of the key differences. We'll start with some high level stuff. Mm -hmm. The children of the forest were the original inhabitants of Westeros, which you can immediately see how that's a parallel to the natives being the original. I mean, hence, that's why they're called natives. Yeah. That's the whole point. So, and similarly, the downfall of the children of the forest is largely due to overseas invaders, which mm -hmm. is pretty similar to the downfall of the Native Americans and uh, multiple invasions in, in the case of uh, the real world, but also multiple invasions in the case of Westeros. Um, in the in Westeros, first we had the the first men who eventually learned to live in peace with the children of the forest and even adopted their religions. But later we saw the great Andal invasions. Now the Andals are really similar both in migration pattern and name to the Angles, especially because the Angles were uh, people that settled in Britain, mm -hmm. and the Angles weren't the first people in Britain. Not just like the Andals weren't the first people in Westeros. Now, the more obvious comparison in terms of name similarity to Andals is Vandals, mm -hmm. and that's more than just a name similarity, too. The real Vandals and George R. R. Martin's Andals are both described as tall and fair-haired, and both had a bit of a technological advantage when they arrived on the scene. Um, better steel, things like that. Better iron, better metalworking. We also see a lot of Native Americans carving things like uh, stone or wood. And a lot of these are kind of frightening. You look back on some of these like stone carvings in South America, some of them I've been to, and they're really kind of spooky and creepy. And that was kind of the point. Mm -hmm. And the similarity there is the heart trees, the werewoods of Westeros that have these awful sort of frightening faces that when 
humanity first arrived in Westeros, they saw these trees and were freaked out and reacted as, you know, early ancient man often does with violence. And they attacked these trees and chopped them down. And that caused the children of the forest to go to war with them because those are basically their sacred trees. And well, you know, the rest is history, as they say. Now, going back to how Daniele introduced this subtopic, if we were talking about flaying, you would be faced with the same situation. If Daniele's talking about flaying, it's probably the ancient Mexica. But if I'm talking about flaying, if History of Westeros is bringing it up, it's probably House Bolton of the Dreadfort, who are rumored to hang the skins of flayed enemies in some sort of hidden chamber in the castle. And that's supposed to be a fa- ancient history, although maybe they still do it. The Mexica are both interesting enough and well-documented enough to provide the opportunity for George to give some of these features to people besides the children of the forest. The children of the forest didn't do any flaying that we know of. He decided to let the house Bolton have that. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's the, that's one of the house Bolton tendencies. Yes. And they say our blades are sharp. That's their official motto, their mm-hmm. house motto. Our blades are sharp. And well, that's a wonderful parallel to the ancient world, even modern world. It's hard to find something that, can reach the sharpness of obsidian. Even back then, obsidian is just unbelievably sharp. It can still be used in in surgery and things like that. Modern steel has surpassed it, but it was, it's, it's as sharp or sharper than ancient steel. Game of Thrones has Valyrian steel. Of course, that's a little different, but that, but even that is rumored to involve obsidian in world. So that parallel is very rich. Yeah, so, and there will be others, as we're soon going to see in the Bolton Mexica comparison. Both, you know, we saw the flame, we'll see, uh, we see the idea of Ramsey Bolton definitely loves his dogs. Well, the people <laughs> who interact with him probably don't love his dogs quite as much for reasons we will see, because he likes to feed people to them. The Mexica didn't do this part. They were quite bloody but not so much on the other hand the people who conquered them the conquistadors did they were quite fond of feeding people to dogs so you can see how but but let's start with the obsidian example that you brought up you know obsidian it was a huge thing in mesoamerica because they did not have uh, modern metallurgy they did not have steel weapons obsidian however is an insanely sharp um, among possible stones that you can use for cutting, you can't do any better than obsidian. It's very, very sharp. The main problem was uh, in fighting the conquistadors that obsidian breaks if you strike any kind of iron. So the type of armor that the conquistador would wear would make them somewhat invulnerable to obsidian blades. On the other hand, if you manage not to strike armor and you touch skin, whatever was there is gone. There's a tale, for example, of the Mexica just chopping the head of a Spanish horse with a single blow. That tells you something about the sharpness of uh, obsidian blades. And they were used as weapons. They were used for sacrifice. You know, Mexica religion was very much built around human sacrifice, where the idea of offering blood to the gods was a central part of what kept the universe going. There are some parallels even there with Game of Thrones. Want to jump into that? Yeah, definitely. Like I said, the of course, they call obsidian obsidian or they call it dragon glass in Game mm-hmm. of Thrones. Same thing in terms of what it means. Now, George R. R. Martin has said that his a version of obsidian mm-hmm. is not quite the same as real world obsidian, but it's close enough. It certainly has this same aspect of sharpness to it. Now, One thing that I think is really interesting about what Daniele said is that you consider the environment. You say, wow, how could, you know, how could they use these as weapons when they break so easily? Well, as you also said, they didn't have metallurgy, so they didn't have armor that it would break on so often. They were just wearing, you know, I guess leather was probably the strongest armor they had. Yeah, cotton, leather, stuff like that. Yeah, maybe and wicker shields, things like that, that would trap the weapon rather than you know, be able to block it yep. like a wooden shield would. And this, we're, we're given very little on the ancient children as far as their own infighting. Mm-hmm. But we do know that they had a, a race of warrior class. It's not a different race. It's just, I should just say it was a class amongst the children called the the uh, wood, I was, if I'm remembering incorrectly, it might be the wood walkers or the, no, the leaf dancers, All right, or the wood dancers. I'm oh. getting my Warhammer 40K and my <laughs> Game of Thrones mixed up. Anyway, they fought with 
they had they were armored in leaves and wood and fought with obsidian. So this is feels a bit like the Mashika, especially as we go deeper into some of the other practices they had, which as dark as flaying is, as we said, the children didn't actually do that. So that doesn't work as a comparison. That's just a House Bolton thing. Yeah. But the human sacrifice thing, that is where we find a very strong parallel. And, you know, there's a lot of human sacrifice in the real world in history. But, you know, we're focusing mostly on Mashika. But it's interesting to think about the different reasons why ancient cultures performed not just human sacrifice, but regular sacrifice. Yeah. Because it's a wide open concept and term. Well, I mean, the whole idea of sacrifice is uh, it's at the foundation of the history of world religions. If you go dig back far enough, all the ancient traditions, including some that are still practiced today, like Hinduism or Judaism, for example, very much feature some form of sacrifice. Probably, I mean, certainly animal sacrifice. There's speculation regarding human sacrifice because there's a lot of that throughout history. So we'll look at some of that. But since we keep mentioning the House Bolton thing, why don't we jump into the, you know, we hinted at this so far. Let's dive a little deeper into this feeding the dogs story. Sure. <laughs> so one of the things we have here is that the Spaniards, they are probably not the only people in history to have done that, but they were kind of specialists in this. When they, around the time when they invaded the Americas in the 1500s, one thing that they would do that, give them a tremendous advantage over the natives is they would have these specially trained attack dogs were trained to basically attack the enemy and rip them to pieces uh, because they were used for warfare they were covered in armor uh, to make it harder for the enemies to shoot them down or kill them it sounds like something out of a video game armored war dogs i know i mean it's <laughs> nuts and you know don't picture chihuahua because that's actually what the mexica had they were used to small dogs they had something like little chihuahua kind of thing that's not what was coming at them that's why when they first saw them they imagined jaguars because they were yeah. these big huge type of dogs a jaguar yeah like if you're used to seeing a house cat and you see a jaguar that's probably a, about accurate to the comparison yeah. Yeah, they were something else entirely that gave them a psychological advantage. And the prevalence of these is there's a lot. You know, there's a, there's an entire book dedicated to this topic, if I remember correctly. It's called The Dogs of Conquest or something like that. That's all about oh. the use of the... Um, the use of the dogs by the Spaniards in conquest. There's a historian, um, Todorov is his last name. I won't even try to pronounce his first name because he's beyond my capabilities. He dedicated his book to the conquest of the Americas to an anonymous Maya woman who was fed to the dogs after she turned down a conquistador's sexual advances. So the response was like, well, if you don't want to go down that path, my dogs are hungry, so let's toss you to the dogs. Oof. Feeding people to dogs was actually a fairly common terror tactic designed to intimidate and scare people into submission. Because, you know, if people know that having... If they know that it's on the menu, the option for you to throw them to the dogs and have them eat you, they are more likely to listen to you than otherwise. So I, I would say so. It would work on me for sure. Yeah, you know? <laughs> that's a powerful <laughs> argument for sure. So if we're looking at the Game of Thrones side of this, it's 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 mostly associated with the character Ramsay Bolton, who we've mentioned already. He is a good example of the fantasy element here, taking things a little farther or bigger, you know, using mm -hmm. our me metaphor from earlier. He doesn't just feed people to the dogs. He lets them loose and then hunts them, and then they eat them. And I guess you could almost say this is less cruel as the victim does have a tiny chance of escaping. In the Mashika case, there's pretty much no hope. Now, in, in fact, in World... In Game of Thrones, we're told that this has happened, that a few people have escaped Ramsay, and that might be a very important detail. It might show there's a lesson there. It shows that cruelty is powerful, but it's not dependable, and it also shows that, you know, this kind of arrogance can have a cost. And this is probably how Ramsay's awfulness, the rumor of it, began to spread in the first place as people, as some of his victims escaped. Yeah. Of course, you can't tell secrets like that if you're dead. Yeah, that doesn't now, he, work. <laughs> and he surely understands that on some level that, you know, a dead man tells no secrets. But House Bolton, they're taught a different way. They're taught to think about this in a different way. 
a dead secrets ha- a dead man has no secrets, but a flayed man also has no secrets. <laughs> yeah, that's another way to deliver a message. Uh, the process of flaying, which in case you're not clear of what we're talking about, flaying refers to the removal of the skin, either post-mortem or as a form of torture while people are still alive. It's one of those nasty things that unfortunately they are not just in or Martin's imagination, you know. Mm. Throughout history, people have done it. Um, usually, people would die either from blood loss, infection, or hypothermia. And thanks to Obsidian's amazing sharpness, the Mexica really had the right tools for the job and used these tools rather often. Yeah, the Mexica were not shy about it, and the Boltons also not very shy about it. The, the sigil of their house is a flayed man, after mm-hmm. all. <laughs> Now, supposedly they gave up this practice some a thousand years or so before the series begins. However, it's clearly not entirely gone. The, the Ramsey Snow slash Bolton, he loves flaying people. We get to see it happen, which is one of the odd differences between the books and the show. You don't actually see the flaying happen in the books. Ram, uh, Roost, or rather, Theon just disappears for a few books while he's being tortured, and then you kind of find him again in the dungeon. Right. And... But you also hear some sort of queerly creepy comments by Roos, Ramsey's father. He once in the books argues against human skin boots, not because it's gross or evil or, or uncouth. It's he says it's just inferior material. <laughs> he says, yes. no, you'd much rather. <laughs> it's totally just about the quality of the material. And so that implies knowledge of the of the <laughs> you yes know, you must have tried them. it's like mm, yeah those boots didn't quite cut it give me <laughs> give me the other ones it's uh, too cool co- you need something thicker for that north yeah in the conquest of mexico series that i did i told this one story about flame it goes back to pre-columbian times in 1323 when uh, the mexica asked the new ruler of culhuacan which was an important no mexica city within the valley of mexico they ask for his daughter so that she could be married to one of the Mexica prince, and then she would be turned into the go- one of their goddesses. Now the king figure, yeah. okay, that means they want to honor her or something. That's not the way they meant it. When they say turn her in one of the goddesses, what the Mexica was were doing, they were actually planning to sacrifice her. You know, they believed that by doing this, the princess would uh, join the gods herself so they saw it as yeah we are turning into a goddess now probably would have been a good idea to clarify this point but so that's a bit of a problematic case of miscommunication right there because what (laughs) happens is that during a feast attended by both sides a mexica priest came out wearing the flayed skin of the princess as part of the ritual (laughs) and you know the mexica thought we paid a great honor to both the princess and her father that's not exactly how the king or the people of Culhuacan felt. They were disgusted. <laughs> they thought the Mexica were just complete psychos. And and again, this is not the kind of thing that then you can explain, say, hey, sorry about that. We just misunderstood. You know, we thought it was an honorable thing. You know, yeah, we'll put it. We'll put her skin back on. I'm sorry. We'll we'll go back. Take back. <laughs> yeah, people don't take it well. So. The Mexica, however, were not the only people in history skinning people. And, you know, those of you guys who have been listening to my podcast, they're like, okay, enough already. Give us examples that are not something you've discussed already. Okay, (laughs) so here are a few other things. About roughly 3,000 years ago, the Assyrians gained a reputation for being the kind of people you really didn't want to mess with. They openly advertised this in their carved monuments. You know, they would tell people about the horrible things that they would do to the people who crossed them. And as it turns out, Flayne was one of them. There was uh, an Assyrian ruler. I'm going to try to venture a guess on the pronunciation of his name. Ashur. Okay, I'm not going to venture a guess. <laughs> Just know that he was an Assyrian ruler from 3,000 years ago or so. <laughs> Uh, he ruled between 1883 and 1859 uh, before Common Era. Here is one of the things that he left behind. He said, I've made a pillar facing the city gate and have flayed all the rebel leaders. I've clad the pillar in the flayed skins. I let the leaders of the conquered cities be flayed and clad the city walls with their skins. 
the captives have killed by the sword and flung on the dung heap. The little boys and girls were burned. Wow. Yeah, that's some heavy stuff. That's incredibly heavy and yikes. And I, I, I've i certainly heard about some of this myself. One thing that we want to do in this episode is since we can't cover everything and some of these topics have a lot more to them, we are occasionally going to offer a recommendation. Usually it's going to be one of our one of our episodes, either one of History on Fires or one of History, on Westro- History of Westeros. But I highly, in this case, I want to highly recommend Hardcore History, which most of you have heard of because both Danielle and I have talked about Dan Carlin at length. And Dan Carlin is, has been podcasting for longer than most people in the game at all. And he has an episode called Judgment at Nineveh, which covers this Assyrian ruler and his some of his predecessors and uh, some of his ancestors, some of the people who came after as well. And the fall of of this Assyrian Empire was really fast and interesting. And partly because they were so cruel, people were just so ready to get rid of them. So anyway, like I said, that's a great story. And if you haven't somehow haven't listened to Hardcore History before, well, just tell them that uh, History and Fire and History of Westeros sent you. Yes, Dan is the man. We are going to skim through a few examples of lane throughout history because there's so many that one could just spend, write a whole book on the topic. A rather uh, gross and, book, but... And surprisingly, there are not a lot of other examples in Game of Thrones. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's actually, this is a case where history far outdoes the Game of Thrones now. Yeah, apart, apart from the Boltons, there's only one example, and that's just, a, it's a punishment used on some of the slaves in Slaver's Bay around where yep. Daenerys, the area that Daenerys, and that's it, that's it. I mean, I'm sure it's happened in other times in Westeros, it just doesn't come up. Whereas, anyway. jump in for this flame rap, I'll try to make it quick, but in uh, <laughs> 1303, the treasury of Westminster Abbey was robbed while they had a lot of money there belonging to King Edward I. So after the inquiry that follows, they arrest and interrogate 48 monks, and three of them were found guilty of robbery, and so they were promptly flayed. The skin was attached to three doors as a warning against anybody thinking that robbing the church or the state was a good idea. So (laughs) there's one right there. In the Talmud, there's a story about the Romans flaying alive a rebellious rabbi, there's also an unconfirmed but popular tradition that holds that San Bartolomeo, uh, one of the early apostles of Christianity, went to Armenia to preach the gospel, and while there he was flayed alive before being crucified. Because, you know, crucifying you by itself is not quite enough. Let's flay you <laughs> and crucify you. That's... Let's combine two of the worst possible punishments ever. <laughs> yeah, now, there's not a whole lot of hard historical evidence that this actually happened, so it's possible that it's just a complete myth, but you know, worth mentioning in any, in any case. Yeah. What do we have next? We got, oh, one case that was rather disturbing. There's a story of a famous Greek philosopher and scientist, a lady named Hypatia of Alexandria, who lived between the latter part of the 300s and the early 400s. In 415 Common Era, a Christian mob accused her of being an advisor to the city's governor, which... It was true, she was an advisor to the city's governor. And the problem was that the city's governor was involved in this long-standing feud with some of the locals in the Christian community. So this mob kidnapped her and then used broken tiles to flay alive the female philosopher because they accused her of being a pagan and a negative political influence. And in their minds, the only way to properly dealing with a pagan woman was to skin her alive because, you know, Clearly, nothing would please Jesus more than torture into death an unarmed woman. You know, oh, clearly, clearly, yeah, it makes sense. But <laughs> now, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. This is a, some historical traditions suggest that this same Christian mob destroyed the Library of Alexandria. Well, I mean, the Library of Alexandria was torched so many times that it's amazing that anything was left ever. So <laughs> there was, but yes, there are. Uh, there's. It's one of the things that happened more than once. And somehow they often save some books and then... But yes, this is where... These guys were not big fans of... Their approach was <clears throat> anything that's not the Bible. We don't need it. We don't care. So mm-hmm. they were not big fan of classical knowledge. That's for sure. 
Which is really funny because none of them could even read the Bible, right? Like that yeah, was, was right. written in Latin and none of them could even read of course. it. Like, it's, it's, we know this book is good even though we can't read it and haven't read it. Yeah, but, <laughs> you know, as you can guess from the reaction to somebody that they just perceive to be a negative political influence, just, they they were not exactly moderates, these guys. They went a little <laughs> over exactly. the top. Yeah. There are a bunch of other examples. Let's jump real quick into a few. <clears throat> a certain Pierre Basile was flayed alive and all the defenders of the chateau were hanged in 1199 by order of a mercenary leader. Why did they do that? Because these guys had shot and killed King Richard I of England with a crossbow during a siege. And so once the castle was stormed and they took them over, they decided it wasn't just enough to kill them. They had to send a message that killing kings is bad. Mad that he lost his employer because, you know, now uh, after Richard... It King John took over and, you know, no one, no one liked him. Yeah, very unfair. <laughs> and if I remember correctly, Richard actually, at least some historical traditions say that Richard praised Pierre for, get, for his good shot. Yeah. And he, he would not have done this, but because he was a little more chivalrous. But hey. Doesn't quite always breaks. work. Yes. Yeah. Uh, other offenses that got you to be flayed. In 1314, there were a couple of uh, brothers who... Uh, ended up being lovers of the daughters-in-law of the king of king philip IV of france check this out this is really becoming the lover of these ladies was not a good idea because they flay them alive cast castrate them and chop off their heads and then their bodies are exposed for a while so the idea was hey you didn't ask for proper permission you do not sleep with the <laughs> king's uh, daughters-in-law this is the punishment there's yeah. even a notion that uh, you want to mention regarding Cersei's walk yeah. of shame, how this relates to this. Yeah, there's there's a little bit of relation to Cersei's walk of shame because she committed crimes against the royal family, even though she was part of it. But she was flayed of clothing, not skin. And there's a better parallel to her later. So we'll get to that a little farther on. Now, Jamie Lannister as well is committed similar crimes or at least crimes of les majest uh i didn't say that right but you know what i mean yeah and po he probably won't ever be punished for that but you would he might should be under those rules would be a good example of that marjorie tyrell in the books is waiting trial for the same possibly false accusations that got her thrown into the high sparrows dungeons on hbo and history of westeros listeners will have heard me mention many times the accursed king series by maurice drewan and George R. R. Martin considers it a huge influence. And mm -hmm. this incident uh, of the brothers Dionne that Daniele just mentioned is part of that saga. And in fact, there's more about this incident with Philip the, the Philip IV, also called Philip the Fair or Philip the Handsome, but also by a name that will really resonate for Game of Thrones fans. He was called the Iron King. And this same title is taken by Kings of Salt and Rock, on the Iron Islands. They call themselves Iron King. Balon Greyjoy crowned himself, you know, the Iron King of the Iron Islands. And his uncle, Euron, Theon's uncle Euron did the same thing. Now, not a whole lot of resemblance to Philip IV other than that title, though I guess you could say Euron's a little bit handsome. Um, the Ironborn would, would drown people, whereas Philip preferred the opposite. You could call it Drowning the opposite of burning people, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. Water, right. Water and fire. So the Iron King is the same man who kills off the Templar Knights. He finishes them off. He burns the last Grand Master of the Templars at the stake. And this is how the Accursed King series starts and how, and this is, of course, real, what really happened, you know, for the most part in history. Um, this is probably being, you know, there's this new History Channel show called Nightfall that is almost certainly going to cover all this because... Philip the Iron King is one of the main characters and the Templars are all part of that show. So uh, not much to say about that TV show, but just to mention that it's being covered somewhere. So in case um, this recommendation here is something new to you, well, The Curse of Kings is great. I would highly recommend it. You can get it through Amazon. You can buy the books either through Daniele's links on his website or we have the same links on the History of Westeros' website. Highly recommend those books. Really good. George R. R. Martin also says they're great and you can see why so but we're not done with the flaying examples oh no let's not 
Let's not pretend that there aren't more flaying examples. We got to get back to that for another minute or two. <laughs> but I swear I'll make it quick so that we can then jump into another con, another topic. There's something else equally awful and horrible. And <laughs> yeah, there's there's another case that's interesting. In um, 1571, there was the Venetian commander Marc Antonio Bragadin had uh, negotiated a surrender with the Ottoman Empire. The Ottomans had been laying siege to a city in Cyprus that Bragadin was defending. So the Ottoman commander had agreed to let Bragadin and his men leave after surrendering the city, but then decided, you know what, on second thought, so he betrayed the deal and instead had Bragadin flayed to death on the public square. Pleasant. Yeah, uh, so there's that. Now, what happens is eventually they hung the skin along with the heads of several of Bragadin's generals on the masthead pennant of the Grand Vizier's personal galley. And this will be a rather important thing because that will be part of the very famous Battle of Lepanto, which is this naval battle between uh, Europeans versus the Ottoman Empire, and uh, Europeans will win and they will sort of get their revenge. And in many ways, the the flame of the Venetian commander was such a horrifying thing that it helped unify European opposition to the Ottomans. So it turned out to be, you know, in some cases the flame works out because it's used as an intimidation tactic that gets you what you want. In this case, it had the opposite effect of horrifying people enough as to unite them against the Ottomans. Mm. Plenty other examples. The Persian king Cambyses II was quite fond of flame. Uh, lots of examples from Chinese history. I read about the Comanche tribe using flame as a form of torture. Now, I'm a little sketchy on this one because the only source I found this in was the book Empire of the Summer Moon, mm. which is not the most reliable history book I've ever run into. There are several parts in the book where there are some distortions of the historical record, some parts, so it kind of some I'm a little suspicious of anything that comes from that book, so maybe true, but take it with a grain of salt. I would feel a lot better if it came from a more reliable source. You know, I could go on and on, but suffice to say, humans in many places throughout history can give Ramsey Bolton a run for his money. <laughs> and it's actually surprising, as you said, that there's not, you know, the examples in Game of Thrones are few. There's a lot more in uh, real history than there are in Game of Thrones. Yeah, so I guess we'll give history the the win in yeah. the, the flaying category here. <laughs> Although I will say one thing George did that was interesting was he tried to put you get a point of view from someone who's been flayed and uh, partially flayed. That's Theon. And you also get an example of a woman who was forcibly married by Ramsay Bolton. This is in the books only yeah. where they when they find her, she's been locked in a tower and she's bitten off all her own fingers and they thought it was at first it's told to you through the books that she is she did this because she was starving mm -hmm. but you later find out that she bit them off because they were flayed right and you it's the way to end the pain yeah and uh it's just so disturbing but you know that's part of what george likes to do is he wants to show you just you know you know it's awful intellectually but he wants to give you the perspective on just how awful it really is. Yeah, no, he's not shy about that, that's for sure. Not at all. <laughs> and so, of course, there's another topic that um, would... Uh, appe Actually, before we jump into another topic, real quick recommendations. Yeah. Um, want to jump in and tell yeah, people? Yeah, I, I want to recommend your four-part series on the conquest of Mexico, which is just awesome. I've listened to it twice. It's the story of Cortez and the the natives the aztecs as as we call them or more properly called the mexica and it's it's really great and i think it's a lot a story that a lot of people don't know and it's there it's it's not um as long ago as it might feel like it was we're talking five six hundred years ago not thousands of years ago or something mm -hmm. like roman era so the the sources are pretty good you know for that era um and that's that's great but also i want to throw out an honorable mention to your special episode that to patrons and donors but it's you you called it the godfather of mesoamerica and it struck me that this guy this character is so much like lord walder frey mm -hmm. the fact that he's a really old guy that is just a consummate power player who really, who genuinely cares about his own family. It's like his one redeeming quality, but otherwise is just dirty and underhanded and backstabby and 
unfortunately quite intelligent too. So I really think that fans of Game of Thrones will like that. Plus, you threw in a couple of Game of Thrones references in that episode anyway. I always do. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and of course, on my end, we have a House Bolton episode made back in 2012. It's it's one of the first. It's not the first episode we ever made, but it's the first one we ever put on video. So it's a uh, it's a little rawer than our newer stuff, but the information's good. Cool. One thing one thing we kind of didn't touch on too much was cannibalism. I want to back up and just talk about that just sure. for another minute. Actually, let's start with you and and have you explain just real briefly how cannibalism played a a part in the flaying and sacrifice aspects of this. Because as well, as I said earlier, sacrifice throughout many different cultures takes a lot of different forms, and this cannibalism is actually kind of part of that sacrifice, isn't it? Yeah, most definitely. The um, in Mexica history, cannibalism was uh, humans were definitely on the menu. There's a hilarious <laughs> moment where um, the emperor, the Mexica emperor Moctezuma, send an ambassador to the Spaniards and say, hey, if those guys by any chance want to eat you, please let them, you know, I'll make sure to take care of your families. But, you know, we never know. Maybe they like humans as much as we do. So just in case, you know, if they want to eat you, let them. It's all good. <laughs> the... You know, cannibalism wasn't purely a dietary thing. You know, they did not eat human beings on a regular. So they would, uh, after sacrificing people, they would uh, chop off their arms and legs and then uh, serve them to as a honored thing to their warriors in uh, these uh, parties that they would have afterwards. So, yes, and a happy tale. <laughs> very, very happy. Now, cannibalism in Game of Thrones is is not so explicit. There's, It's not really mentioned in the show. It's more a part of the books, so I'll keep it brief, um, as that will probably miss a few extra people who are listening to this, because I know more people have certainly seen the show than read the books. There's a small island very far in the north called Skagos that has cannibalism associated with it. Now, this is not a religious thing in this case. It's more of a... a, a it's, it's more... A tradition born from deprivation. It's a cold, frozen wasteland, and sometimes that's the only meat available. It's more of that sort. It's it's more of a do this or die kind of situation, or so we're told. We've never seen Skagos firsthand. Those are just this is all, you know, rumors and just what the learned people of Westeros tell the reader. So the truth the truth in George R. R. Martin's mind is probably different from what he's presenting us because, as as I've said a few times. He doesn't give you the whole story yeah. um, because that wouldn't be realistic. Right. So the other example that's really quite sneaky and um, a little disturbing is that when Bran is marching towards the cave that he eventually finds himself in where he learns a lot about his powers and all that. In the books, they're the, the, the guy who shows up to rescue him, them later, Benjen, is there's a different guy who shows up earlier to help him. It's a similar situation, but he, he helps them get to the cave instead of help them escape. Anyway, he goes off and finds some, kills some uh, rogue Night's Watchmen. This is the same ones that you see killed uh, by Jon Snow and his friends. Mm -hmm. And they, when this this undead ranger comes back to Bran, he gives them parts of the, one of the, part, some meat from these bodies. But he tells them it's a pig. He tells them I found a sow and brought right. you food. So it's, creepy that he's eating human and doesn't know about it. And there's a there's a chance that Arya does this at the House of Black and White also. It's not entirely clear, but it's uh it's there but sneaky. So sadly I've seen that, that out there. Uh, I've seen that in the news quite a bit too. I've heard more than one story about stuff like that happening in various parts wow. of the world where people were serving at their restaurant human meat and of course when they get busted they get I heard, I read this story in China when somebody got in the death penalty for doing that but in any case let's try to wow. keep it as far back history to feel a little more comfortable <laughs> to not <laughs> but you yeah know, so you're, you're mentioning cannibalism as part of um, human sacrifice so let's look at human sacrifice a little bit both in yeah. history and in uh, Game of Thrones in history we'll keep it quick because it's such a big topic by itself that yeah. uh, there's a lot of it it's you know dark and bloody it's it's really um also i want to say real quick it's the mashika as you've shown us is mostly about but definitely not entirely about but frequently about sacrificing your enemies sure sacrifices as you say it comes in so many different forms a lot of times it's just you you offer some grain or a piece of a dead animal or yeah. you know in a lot of ways when people pour a little 
pour their 40 ounce out on the ground and say for the homies. It's it's kind of the same thing. Yeah. But ancient traditions usually required more than that. A sacrifice isn't really a sacrifice unless you're giving up, in a lot of traditions, unless you're giving up something of real value. Your enemies, you're killing them and imprisoning them anyway. That's yeah. not a sacrifice. No, exactly. It's like they don't, they don't count quite as much. No, it needs to be something that you care, that you love. That's more the real deal. It's interesting, by the way, the thing that you mentioned about sort of uh, dropping liquor on your friend's grave kind of idea, because in some way this idea of feeding the dead it shows up like and there's a lot of evidence to indicate that uh, ancient gladiatorial games were originally a form of human sacrifice that were fo- the duels were fought at the grave in front of so that the blood of one of the dead would feed the, the... but we'll jump into that oh, let wow. me let me give one example that i thought was really interesting because it very much relates to game of thrones now this is not probably is not history it's hard to tell because it goes back to the Iliad and we don't know how much of that is history, how much of that is just ancient literature. There's a long standing debate regarding the historicity of uh, the siege of Troy and all of that. So here is what we have. The, um, well, why don't you tell us first the Game of Thrones version? Sure. And I'll then I jump into the historical one. Perfect. And I want to add to what you said as well before I get into this, which is to say that you're right. You're, it's, it's important and accurate to say that we don't know about a lot of these things and know how they went. But what almost what matters more is what people at the time believed. Yep. If they believed that this happened, that Troy, the battle of the, the, the war with Troy happened, it's almost as if it really did. Um, and that's something that George R. R. Martin likes to play with a lot, too. He has a lot of things in his world that the common folk dismisses superstition, which isn't. A great example is the ritual of the drowning for the Iron Islands. Sure. They think that the drowned god is giving life to this person and re- they're reborn under the water. But it's just CPR. Right. It's <laughs> just CPR. It's that simple. Yeah. And that's a wonderfully succinct way of showing ancient superstitions you know, the pulling the, you know, pulling the wool off from their eyes and showing what's really going on. So in this case, whether the myths are real or not, people believed in them. And so what we're going to go here with is Stannis. And the perfect example of Stannis in history is Agamemnon. And now I'll talk about the Stannis side of this. What's more personal in terms of sacrificing than a member of your own family, your own child? In Stannis's case, his only child. Mm -hmm. This is... In a show filled with hard to watch moments of extreme violence, you know, one of the toughest is Stannis' daughter by burning her alive. I mean, there's so many awful violent moments in the Game of Thrones, uh, but this one isn't just hard to watch. It's hard to hear. Shireen actress Carrie Ingram is really talented, and it's funny that her talent really comes out in a moment like that, which is so horrible, but with her screaming. It's so believable. That, by and, the way, was the one moment where I almost gave up on Game of Thrones. Oh, wow, That yeah. was, out of all of the ones, I was like, you know, I think <laughs> I may be done. Like, I st- <laughs> stuck around, and then I was like, okay, now I feel better about the series, but that was the one moment when watching it, and I'm like, yeah, I don't know if I want to watch it anymore. That was... Yeah, and you have a young daughter, so it probably yeah. hits a little harder. Yeah, that's just, geez, it's so rough. Now, the reason Stannis does this in the show is that they're just deluged, just submerged in ice and snow, and it's yep. really bad. Um, so it's a, and it, here, here kicks in our, our comparison, both in terms of the myth we're comparing this to and in terms of the concept we introduced at the beginning of this episode, which is making it bigger. In the case of Agamemnon, he was concerned with weather, too, but yeah. the weather situation wasn't nearly as bad as wind and snow threatening to kill them all. Uh, similar, though, in one sense. The tale of Agamemnon goes like this. The ones he had organized all the Greeks to go after Troy, so they are kind of getting ready to sail away in this expedition. There, he, they had one problem. They had Agamemnon had made an enemy of the god the Artemis, which is always a bad idea to make the gods mad at you there are different <laughs> versions for what he had done to anger the goddess but in either case one of the prophets among the greeks said that only by sacrificing his daughter agamemnon would be able to lift the curse change the winds and allow the greek army to depart for troy without that they would never be able to depart 
So in some versions of the story, his daughter is led to believe that she's about to be married to the great hero Achilles, you know, the greatest hero in the Greek army. And instead, rather than going to the altar for marriage, she is going to the altar but to be sacrificed, which is kind of similar to what happens in Game of Thrones with the victim being the last one to find out what's about to happen. Yeah, Shireen was the last to know. She walks outside and everyone's like a raid in front of the pyre and she still doesn't know what's happening. And, and then a minute later, she the awfulness of her situation sets in. Whew. That yeah. that just made it all the more terrible. Just her not knowing. Yeah, just every part of that scene. They just did every, hit every button to make it yeah. as awful as it could be. <laughs> that was really <laughs> as bad as it gets. Um, the good news is that if you survive that scene, then you can definitely watch the rest of Game of Thrones. because It's really hard to imagine something worse happening. You know? Yeah, <laughs> that's pretty bad. There are, oddly enough, this topic shows up in the weirdest places. You know, not only in uh, ancient Homeric writing, even if you look at the Bible, you find this kind yeah. of story. There's in the book of Judges, there's a key character, this guy, I have no idea how to pronounce it, I'm taking a guess, Jephthah? No clue. Sounds good. Case, he's an outlaw turned general of the Jewish armies in a campaign against their enemies. And, you know, he's about to lead the Israelites into battle. And in exchange for defeating his enemies, he makes a vow that he will sacrifice whatever will come out of the door of his house first. So, you know, when he comes back home, the first thing he sees coming out of the door of the house, he will sacrifice. Now, there were lots of barn animals that you'd have in the house. You'd have your chicken, you'd have... So he, oh, he probably was thinking, you know, some dumb chicken will step out of the house. Great, I sacrifice it and I fulfill my vow. That's not how it goes in the biblical literature, because his daughter is the one exiting the, ha the house. He immediately regrets the vow, uh, because now he has to sacrifice his daughter, but you don't get to have regrets once you make promises to the gods. So that's, you know, another fairly ugly story of human sacrifice, in this case, found in the pages of the Bible. Mm. There are also lots of references to the Carthaginians, sacrificing their kids for favorable outcomes um, some people there's a debate about this some people think that this was a roman smear campaign that they were trying to sound that make them sound worse than they were and since the romans destroyed all carthaginian sources it's very much a one-sided tale so we don't know is this real history or is this was the romans talking crap about the carthaginians we are That's not entirely yeah. sure you know this is one i'm particularly interested in as well I've, I've always been fascinated by the story of rome and carthage and it's it's very disappointing that every source is roman there's not a scrap of carthaginian sources out there really and that's the classic uh histories written by the winners right yeah that's no it, it, perfect the example. Most extreme example of it yeah yeah and uh there's there's a lot of it's partly because george r martin borrowed some roughly some of these Carthaginian slash Phoenician gods and these this, these tales of sacrifice, whether they're true or not, he borrowed some of that and, and gave them into some of his uh, extra cities that are yeah. in the world building. The city of Kohor has a god called the Black Goat, which is there's human sacrifice involved there. And there's a lot of examples out there. But I really believe that for this particular, the, the story of the sacrifice of Shireen, I really think that one is the Agamemnon story. I, I totally agree. The parallels are too many. I don't think it's a coincidence at all. Yeah. Not every example of comparison of myth to Game of Thrones is quite as dark. Well, actually, I should I spoke too soon. This one's very dark, but dark <laughs> in a different sense. <laughs> I meant dark metaphorically yeah one of the biggest comparisons and this is a very fairly common trope in fantasy is to mm -hmm. have a world that is had some sort of apocalypse or cataclysm in its recent or ancient past in our own world we sort of have that the biblical flood is mm -hmm. the example of that and and it's considered semi-historical because there's so many different historical traditions that contain talk about it traditions that couldn't possibly have interacted with each other but still uh, and that's comparison to the dark, long night of, of Westeros, which affected the whole world, not mm -hmm. just the continent of Westeros. And from that long night, in that long night, much knowledge was lost, much civilization vanished and history, whatever happened before is lost forever and et cetera. So it's it's really interesting comparison like that. So 
it's a good, um, quite a lot to dig into there. So this is a good place for some more recommendations. In this case, my own Battle of Ice series, uh, which is a three-part series, talk quite a lot about Stannis' decision, what might happen later, as well as a lot of the potential outcomes for that. Also, we have a review of Season 5, Episode 9, which is when uh, the Shireen burning occurred. But also uh, a recommendation for an entirely different podcast, uh, Tro the Trojan War podcast. It covers the story of Agamemnon quite well, and I'm a fan of that show. So if you are interested, that is a good place to look. Yeah, very good podcast, for sure. Yeah, we're about halfway through. It's time to give some additional thanks. This time to our Blood Riders. That includes Cole Coey, Master of the Bow called Sunpiercer. This time, her kill is for whoever sent the cold of the winter to the south. A lot of us are feeling that pain, but I can imagine that y'all in the north are feeling it pretty hard too, even though you're more used to it. Also thanks to Vorsaki, wielder of a Valyrian steel arak with a dragonbone hilt. And thanks to our swords, Peter Blaze of the Emerald Isle, captain of the Werewood Wanderers, to long lives, quick deaths, cold beer, and warm women. Dagron, marshal of the axe, captain of the Red Tide, resistance is futile. Chiron Callsbane is captain of the stone shields, the torrent breaks upon the stone. Hema Helminth is captain of the Whispering Children. Dead men tell no secrets. Lady Lajara Dajo is the Iron Lily, Master Archer, Castellan of the Summer Island Keep Arboreal Point, captain of the all-female Wailing Widows, women and children first. Cody the Crimson is Bastard of Bracken, captain of the Red Waste Exiles and recruiter of the Free Folk. Cameron the Hammer of Hornwood is captain of the English Lions with the motto, Honor is the Reward of Virtue. And Lord Brandon Brewer of Castle Blackrune is captain of the Shadow Wolves. Our steel is cold, our vengeance colder. And still brewing fine ale. And of course, thanks to Valentin of House to Gen, creator of the free Game of Predictions website. A lot of fun making predictions on the futures of Game of Thrones and A Song of Ice and Fire. And it's totally free. That's gameofpredictions.org. Let's uh, move on to some other ancient people comparisons. Uh, at its core, Westeros is basically medieval. You know, there's there's a lot of things from other cultures and time periods that have made its way in, but that's the dominant uh, origin, you could say. Mm -hmm. Most of the technology is really roughly equivalent, minus a few conspicuous items that originated elsewhere. Now, the interesting thing that seems like it's a fantasy element is this this legendary sword Dawn wielded by worthy members of a, of a house called House Dane, and it's mm -hmm. forged from a fallen star. That's like, again, that sounds like fantasy a meteorite sword, right? But right. no, that is totally a real world thing. There are several examples of meteor swords and me meteor meteoric items. In fact, the oldest forged metal items known to mankind are beads, some 5,000 year old beads made from a meteorite. And wow. the reason this isn't fantasy and the reason this can happen in ancient times before humans were able to heat iron normally is because of the atmosphere. If something falls through the atmosphere, it gets superheated. Mm -hmm. And humans, ancient humans couldn't do anything to generate that kind of heat. Now, over time, we learned how to do that. But it actually makes sense that there would be these advanced weaponry prior to ironworking because of this, you know, what we would call phenomena. And also, meteoric iron has more nickel content, which explains why it's more shiny, more silvery. Mm -hmm. So this actually s explains a lot of, say, the... The, the tale of Azor Ahai, who made his legendary sword Lightbringer by plunging it into the heart of his his wife, Nissa Nissa. It supposedly took 100 days to make that sword. And that sounds like, oh, fantasy, took 100 days to make a sword. Nah. Re, a remake of a real meteoric sword has happened in modern times. It took about three months. There's also King Tut maybe had a dagger, might have been meteoric iron. It's not entirely conclusive. There's a Japanese katana called the Sword of Heaven on display at the Chiba Institute of Technology. It's made from meteoric iron. The Smithsonian has a meteoric dagger forged at the command of the Mughal Emperor Jahagir. And that's only about 150, 200 years ago, not even a long time ago. Also, Mecca's famous Black Stone, which was a meteor that fell from the sky that was even worshipped <laughs> in mm -hmm. its time. So just sounds like fantasy, but it's real life. Quite wild indeed, as usual. Yeah. Um, we can okay. jump. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I could just run through these these other ones really quickly. This sure. Rome Valeria thing. There's a couple other large scale comparisons I can make here that we don't need to spend a lot of time on, but just to draw your attention to them. 
the uh, Rome has a lot in common with the freehold of Valyria. You've got a massive, you know, Valyria was a freehold, Rome's an empire, but that's just a political distinction, not terribly important for this for this purpose. Both vast empires ruled from a central city where all the power players lived instead of it being spread around. Another important comparison is Rome's silver mines, especially the ones in Spain, were just a horror show of of torture and abuse and pollution. And the, the mines of Valyria are very similar in that regard. And this is how the faceless men originated. The treatment of these slaves is where the faceless men came from. Hmm, that's a good one. I did yeah. not know that. Also, the comparison of the city of Tyrosh in Game of Thrones is very similar to the city of Tyre in the ancient world. Tyre, of course, is where the extremely valuable murex snails were discovered. And murex snails, why are they so valuable? Because they made purple dye. Purple was the imperial color. Dyes were really expensive back in ancient times. That purple dye you could sell directly to the royal families everywhere. Rome, purple was the imperial Roman color. Julius Caesar, you know, people like him would, would you don't want to wear purple if you, because that shows you're trying to be a king. It's yep. like a taboo color for the royalty. Yep. And uh, in Game of Thrones, the same thing happens. You have a, a military outpost that discovered these snails. And by changing their diet, they can change what dyes are produced. And uh, there you go. Straight as forward as that. Also, you have the Iron Bank in Game of Thrones, which is this very powerful bank that is so their reach, their political reach is so far that if people don't pay them back, they get killed. We're talking princes and kings and some of the most powerful people there is. That's not too far off from the Italian moneylender class of Venice and, and other, these other related cities that were lending money to all these different medieval kings and uh, getting quite a lot in return and having more power than you might think to force these extremely powerful people to pay them back. Most definitely. So those are some really good ones that you brought up. And then one of the big ones, that's a big part of the story in Game of Thrones, are the Dothraki. Now, it's pretty clear that the Dothraki are based on nomadic steppe peoples, such as uh, the Mongols are the most obvious example that come to mind, but the Mongols are just one of many. The Huns, the Scythians, the, there, there's a long, long list of these people who have... Uh, and, you know, these guys have been the stuff of nightmares for the great sedentary societies for many centuries. You know, up until modern days... Even great empires uh, were often powerless to deal with steppe nomads. Um, they had no city that you could attack. You know, it's not like you can, oh, they attack you, you can go back to attack their city. They are nomadic. They don't have a city. That means they are hard to find because they are constantly on the move. If their scouts see you coming, boom, they are gone. They pack up their tents and they are gone. Even deep into the 1800s, American Indian nomadic tribes were giving a hard time to the U.S. Army. So this is something that... You know, a lot of the Dothraki are based on these guys. Now, one of yeah. the classic populations that you find in um, historical sources are the Scythians. Herodotus tells us something about them, and they come across as rather colorful folks. They are a pastoralist people who worship the sun, practice ritual cannibalism, partook in sweat lodges, consumed marijuana, drank wine out of the skulls of their defeated enemies. That's often, my favorite part. Of course, that's always good. <laughs> were often covered in tattoos. They were rather sexually free with both men and women being able to have multiple partners. Okay, that one is my favorite part. <laughs> and their women were renowned as being fierce warriors and riders. In, many people even speculate that the myth of the Amazons was born based on the historical badassery of Scythian women. One of the related nations, they are not the Scythians, they are the Sarmatians, but they are close enough, had a custom prohibiting the young women to marry until they had killed an enemy in battle. So that tells wow. you something. That tells you a lot, yeah. <laughs> of course, there are the Mongols, you know, you, the whole story of Genghis Khan, you know, taking the Mongols from a tiny tribal society in Mongolia, living in yurts and tending to animals, to uniting all the Mongolian tribes, which will lead to the conquest of a huge chunk of the world. They destroyed two of the most important empires of the times, the Chinese Empire and the Abbasid dynasty. It's estimated that maybe up to 20 million people may have died in the course of uh, Mongolian invasions of parts of Europe, Asia, and the Middle East. 
you know, they probably would have conquered easily all of Western Europe if it weren't for the fact that after Genghis' death, there were political divisions among them. So there's that quite powerful. Now, one of the differences I've noticed is that whereas, uh, in, for example, the Scythians we mentioned have these very powerful women, the Dothraki in the Game of Thrones narrative are this ultra macho society. You hardly see their women. They are primarily, they don't really seem that important. Yeah. Whereas in many of steppe nomadic societies, women were more powerful than they are in Dothraki society. But other than that, I saw a lot of similarities there. Yeah, I totally agree. And it's interesting too, because like you said, there's one place where the comparison kind of doesn't work is how the Mongols progressed. Genghis Khan's origin and the people that came before him really fit well as a parallel. The difference, of course, the Mongols moved on to governing a vast empire, which the Dithraki are nowhere close to being able to do anything like that. But it's interesting to see that when the empire of Valyria fell is part of what allowed the Dothraki to rise. Mm -hmm. And they, in turn, destroyed several other large civilizations that had exa existed for a long time in parallel to China and the Abbasids. In, uh, in the case of the Dothraki, we hear of this nation called Sarnor, who was this very learned people that that uh, ha lived in cities and were tall and cultured and gone now, all destroyed by the Dothraki. And of course, uh, anybody who's uh, looking to listen more regarding nomadic peoples, you really cannot do better than the series Wrath of the Cans by Dan Carlin as part of Hardcore History. That may be one of my very favorite Dan Carlin podcasts ever. I that agree. That series is amazing, so check it out. It's My favorite... Oh, sorry. Oh, One God. of my favorite parts of the Wrath of the Khans is, is his breakdown of just how difficult and amazing horse archery is. And that's something yeah. that you can really compare to the, the Dothraki and how they they would time their shot for when all the, the that brief split second where all four of the horse's hoofs are in the air so that there's no jostling. And you just think yep. about and then thinking about how it's like a bow flex, those bows, they're just so powerful. And it's like, wow, you just have a lot of appreciation for their toughness. Yeah, I mean, it's hard enough to shoot a bow when nothing is moving, there's no wind, <laughs> and you have your feet solidly on the ground, let alone yeah. when you're riding. And those guys had crazy powerful bows. Some people say well over a 100-pound pool, which yeah. is insane. But And um, a lot of Game of Thrones fans are wondering, especially in the books, what will happen, because in the show we've kind of seen it already, how the Dothraki will handle the armies of Westeros. And you see that it's mostly not so good for the armies of Westeros. They can't handle this. They don't know how to handle these tactics. Yeah. So it's something to look forward to is what we'll probably see is the Dothraki's... the the Because in, in history, whenever knights went up against Mongols, the knights got their asses yeah, kicked. Yeah, definitely. You know, the Mongols, you do not beat the Mongols in battle. That's just not how it works. <laughs> yeah, that's true. The, um, so let's uh, move on. Yeah, let's jump into something else. There's, uh, speaking of the nastiness of the whole Game of Thrones narrative, there's a lot of torture and punishment and executions and all of that. Well, guess what? There's a lot of torture, punishment, and execution in human history as well. This is, yeah, this is one of those things where George R. Martin and other authors, they really don't, it's almost that they can't come up with new versions of torture, punishment, and execution. It has all been done. The only way you can add things to it is if you add things that aren't real. Like, well, okay, I'll feed you to my dragon. That can't happen yeah, in real life. Right. But you just have the equivalent of feeding people to dogs. I mean, that's, that's basically the same thing. <laughs> Very much so. There's a great one in Game of Thrones that shows up a lot in history, which is a rather bizarre form of execution. Execution by molten gold. Yeah. That sounds weird because it is. So uh, want to tell us the Game of Thrones version of this? Yeah, so we have this character named Viserys who is sort of a a character, kind of character we've seen in lots of different stories, not fantasy, just fiction anywhere and in real life. A, a guy who is just very, very entitled. He thinks that he deserves to have it all, basically. He deserves mm -hmm. to be king. And this didn't go very well for him because he ended up threatening uh, a powerful warlord's wife who is his own sister that this is how this is Daenerys of course we're talking about and he thought he was going to get himself this big army by marrying his sister to this warlord that you, that's not going to work if you insult this warlord and break their traditions and customs and go against all these things that he thinks he's above yeah so you can see how that wouldn't go well yeah most definitely so we have this guy 
yeah, that, that guy in Game of Thrones will meet a miserable hand, and but we'll see how. There are quite a few examples in history. Now, we're, I'm just going to pick on five of them. Uh, Romans are featured in at least three of them. Two of them are possible but not confirmed, whereas one is confirmed. Now, yeah. typically, why would you feed somebody molten gold as a form of punishment? You're trying to make a poetic point regarding greed. So, you know, yes. it makes sense in that sense to have several Roman examples since it's a bit inevitable that when you conquer people left and right and steal from them, anything that's not nailed to a wall, they may view you as greedy and nurse some revenge fantasies. Yeah, what's what's funny is, this is a quick anecdote, while we were researching this episode, while we were preparing it, mm -hmm. History Channel's Vikings had this incident. They had a molten gold incident while we were making this. It was like, how perfect. So there you go. Just another example coming up like that. Most definitely. One of them involves a guy who had, had during his time was the richest man in Rome and a member of the first triumvirate along with Julius Caesar and Pompey. That's Marcus Licinius Crassus. In 55 before Common Era, he was made consul and given Syria as a province to rule over. Not satisfied with overtaxing the locals for his personal profit, Crassus put in his head the notion that he needed a big military victory. Um, there was, um, it was a little weird for him. He was feeling, he was suffering from a complex about being the only one of the three men of the Triumvirate not to have won a major military victory. So, you know, Caesar had conquered Gaul, Pompey's military exploit were the stuff of legend, and Crassus all he had was money, but little glory. <laughs> you know? Only the most money of all time. <laughs> yeah, which is nice, but, you know, he wanted to be a real man. He's like, uh, I, I don't want to be known as the rich man. I want to be known as the tough guy. And We already have the uh, entitlement uh, parallel covered here, clearly. Yeah, so <laughs> he decided he would it would be a good idea for him to go after the Persian Empire. Problem was that in modern day Turkey, Crassus' forces got crushed by the Persian ca by the Parthian cavalry, and uh, you know the cavalry rightfully refused to engage the Roman infantry, and instead they stayed far away and picked them apart with their powerful bows. Not unlike the Dothraki in Mongols, exactly. Would, yeah. Very similar story. Crassus' son was killed in the action here, and shortly thereafter, Crassus too. He said was separated from the rest of his body, and legend has it that the Parthians poured molten gold in his mouth as a joke regarding his greed. Now, before you feel bad for this guy, remember that he had ordered a crucifixion of 6,000 people following his victory over Spartacus' forces. That's in episode 1 and 2 of History on Fire. Actually, episode 2 of History on Fire. Yeah, good one. And another thing that he used to do, he used to set people's houses on fire in order to buy them at a discount while the fire <laughs> was burning. So, you know, that's not... Ex if anybody deserved to have molten gold poured down their mouth, probably Marcus Licinius Crassus is a good uh, candidate. Yeah. Other Roman example is the Emperor Valerian, who became emperor in 253. Also, this is a case in which Romans were losing territory to the Persians, and so Valerian decided to lead a campaign to regain some land in the Middle East, and things really didn't work out for him. He was defeated in battle in the year 260. He called to negotiate a truce with the Persian uh, King of Kings, Shapur. Shapur, however, was not a big believer in the old-fashioned concepts such as honor in truces, so he promptly betrayed the truce and captured Valerian. The sources here wildly disagree on what happened next, from the more malevolent version to, you know, there are all sorts of possibilities. One of the sinister ones is that Shapur eventually got tired of humiliating him prisoner at every occasion, and he had molten gold poured down his throat. Hmm. So, maybe. <laughs> There's uh, a whole other story involving a guy, uh, Manius Aquilius. This goes back few centuries prior to Valerian time. This was in 89 before Common Era, at a time when Rome was preoccupied with the social war against some of their Italian allies. What happened here is the beginning of the Mithridatic Wars, featuring Mithridates VI of the King of Pontus. Who is one of the most fascinating enemies Rome has fought against in their very long history. Really interesting guy. I highly recommend looking into him. There's uh, Dan Carlin speak about him quite a bit in the in the, the fall of the Roman Republic series. It's very yes. interesting. 
So there's um, this, the Roman historian Appian relates that Manius Aquilius, as head of a Roman commission to Asia and former consul some 13 years prior, he went and ordered that a couple of kings, the kings of Cappadocia and Bithynia, were to be restored. Um, the, what had happened was that Mithridates had uh, kind of taken over their territory. Now, they were restored, but then it was suggested that their debt to Rome could be repaid if uh, Mithridates' own kingdom was invaded and plundered. Because it's like, okay, well, we restored you, that's nice, but you guys owe us now. <laughs> so Nicomedes IV of Bithynia did so kind of reluctantly because, you know, he had agreed to pay a lot of money to the generals and ambassadors who would restore him to power. Now he owed them money, so, you know, we got to do what we got to do. This turns out to be a horrible miscalculation on the part of Aquilius, and that starts the First Mithridatic War. Mithridates not only did he retake Cappadocia and Bithynia, defeating Nicomedes, but in the process of doing that, he gets his hands on good old Aquilius, who quickly finds out, well, you guys are beginning to see a pattern, right? You know what's happening. You are guessing that Mithridates is going to pour molten gold down his throat? Well, you guess correctly. That's exactly what happens. And again, this is supposedly about Mithridates using this kind of punishment as a ironic way of condemning the Romans for their greed. So here is a Mongol story involving a, na- a man named... Uh, you have a guess on the guy's, how to pronounce the guy's name? Inalchuk. I like your guess. That's good. (laughs) He was a governor in a province in the Quaresmian Empire in the early 13th century. 13th century, I meant. And the tale goes like this, that one day in the 1200s, a Mongolian trade caravan shows up into his province. And these were including an ambassador of Genghis Khan. This governor has the bad idea of accusing them of being Mongolian spies, which they may have been, you know, there's very possible, but there's also the possibility that the governor got greedy and he decided that if I accuse all the members of these caravans to be spies, then I can take over all their goods, that's a lot of money, and I get happily rich, even richer than I am. That's at least the way the, the Mongols will tell the story, is uh, this guy did it out of greed. Who as knows? insane as it is to go up against Genghis Khan like that, it is possible. <laughs> yeah, d- that was not a good idea. And uh, he, <laughs> worse than stealing the stuff, he executed every member of this caravan. Ooh. Only one guy escaped the massacre to report back to Genghis Khan. And Genghis Khan, in all fairness, you know, he has a reputation rightfully earned for being a really vicious conqueror. But in this case, he responded in a rather mellow kind of way. Rather than being completely mad about, hey, you killed some 400 of my people or something, he said, hey, what was that about? You know, he sent an ambassador, um, he actually sent three ambassadors back to the sultan, the I guess the guy above the governor, demanding that the governor be punished. Say, hey, you know, I'm not going to take matters into my own hands, but this is one of your own bureaucrats handling this and... And the Sultan Mohammed responded by beheading the Muslim ambassador. They were out of the three ambassadors, one of them was Muslim, chop off the head of the Muslim one, and shaved the beards of these two Mongol companions, which was a big insult in Mongolian culture. Yeah, it's very clear that they're just looking down on them. This is a very much a, you're just these, you know, backward step people. You know, I think that's a big part of it. And that's that's a very much a theme in Game of Thrones, too. Yeah, and they thought that partially because part of their land was there was a big desert that would, they would, the Mongols would have to cross to get here. They thought maybe they wouldn't be able to, except that one day Genghis Khan and this man show up at their doorstep. This is the oh damn moment when the the sultan realized maybe he should have had a more diplomatic approach. So long story (laughs) short, the Mongols will wreck the Quaresmian Empire, will get their hands on the very governor that has started the whole thing, and guess what they do? Yes, you guessed it. They start (laughs) melting some gold and put it down his throat. 
And this all lines up with accusing him of greed. Yep. Right? They just said, you just couldn't help yourself. And this is your punishment. And last but not least, there's an episode from the very end of the 1500s in Ecuador, where same story, basically. Here we have a Spanish governor who has been cheating some of the local natives in the gold trade. So some of the Givaro natives raided the settlement, captured the governor, melted gold, force fed him. Boom, there you go. So this team, mm-hmm. you know, when you see in Game of Thrones uh, this one character being executed via in this fanciful way via molten, melted gold, same thing happened a lot in history. Yeah. What's neat, too, is that it's um, gold makes sense. It's, it's just as a, as a material, it just makes sense for this, too, not just because of the symbolism, but because it does melt easily. You know, it's it's uh, it's soft. Gold is heavy and soft. It's, it's, it's part of why it's made into so many pieces of jewelry, because it's kind of easy to do that with. So, yeah, it's such a it fits in so well. <laughs> Precisely. Now, let's jump into a different kind of story. Let's look yeah. at um Talk about some religions, religious comparisons, which fits in pretty well as a, as a segue, because obviously a lot of religions have tortures and punishments and executions as part of their system. And that, of course, a lot of these these pa- examples we just went through were not very religious in nature, but you can see how they could be <laughs> because of the extremeness of them and the brutality of them. And, you know, thinking of the Inquisition and other examples like that, you can you can see where we're coming from. But we have a couple of specific examples that are close to Game of Thrones, in particular, the High Sparrow and Cersei's Walk. Um, take it away, Danielle. You've got some here's some names here that only an Italian can say right. I'm yes, not even there's try. something I can actually pronounce for a change. That's very <laughs> heartwarming. Uh, yeah, the High Sparrow is one of the key characters in um, in at least some of the seasons of the TV version of Game of Thrones. And, you know, history clearly doesn't lack example of popular religious preachers stirring up religious fundamentalism and gaining a tremendous following. For simplicity's sake, we'll just focus on a couple of them. One guy is uh, from my own hometown of Milan, my native city, Cardinal Carlo Borromeo, he was cardinal there between 1564 and 1584. And Borromeo had his good sides. You know, during a period of plague and famine, he contributed his own money to help feed thousands of starving people. There are a lot of things why people still to this day like him. On the other hand, to modernize, Borromeo was a disturbing figure since he was a hardcore fundamentalist determined to dictate how everybody else had to live their life and use force if they refused to comply. So even some of his contemporaries didn't like him very much at that. So this is where the similarity with the High Sparrow being born a very popular figure among some people in the world of Westeros while being highly unpopular with others come in. Much like the High Sparrow in Game of Thrones, Borromeo had his own, what he referred to as Familia Armata, literally armed family, which was essentially his own private army of religious fanatics how to impose their brand of morality on anyone else. Author Andrew Graham Dixon said the following, Borromeo saw sinfulness everywhere and envisaged his priest as an army of spiritual stormtroopers. He did this thing to separate men and women in church, otherwise they would look at each other, which was the first type of sin. Like most religious fundamentalists, he was pretty harsh regarding how women were are, are dressed, going to church, mm. all of this kind of stuff. That certainly comes up in Game of Thrones as well. And just also to jump in, I'll say that the um, concept of his own private army, as you said, is there in the show. Yep. In the books, they give it a name. They're called the warrior's sons. The warrior is one of the aspects of God in mm-hmm. their belief system. So it's, uh, it all fits very nicely. And speaking of fit very nicely with it, also Borromeo very much believed the idea that penance was the key to salvation. You have to confess ah. your sin and repent, which is yes. literally exactly what the Ice Power and Game of Thrones does. Yes. There's, um, he was very intense in this process. He ordered these confessors to interrogate 
people regarding their knowledge, not only of their own scenes, but other people's scenes. Do they, is any of them reading prohibited books? And, you know, his list of prohibited books also includes some of the best Italian literature that there is out there from Petrarca, Ariosto, Machiavelli, Boccaccio, you name it. And if his confessors decide not to question people about heresy, they, they would be excommunicated. So mm. Borromeo was really ruling with an iron hand, and he wanted to turn Milan into a religious police state, basically. He even went so far as prohibiting most of the festivities that characterized uh, life in Milan at the time. Carnival, need to go. Jousting, need to go. Plays, dances, all of that stuff. And whatever people of Milan enjoyed had to go because it could lead to sin. So, you know, eventually Rome and Spain, which ruled over this area, had to intervene because too many people were upset and otherwise there would be popular uprisings. So Romeo mm -hmm. had to backtrack a little bit. But Borromeo was constantly involved in this weird relationship with the Spanish ruler of the city, since in some cases, in order to get what he wanted, he would threaten to excommunicate them. In other, And again, that's very much a parallel with Game of Thrones, right? Where we see the same dynamics where Cersei thinks she can use the Sparrow and then find out that the Sparrow is emerging as a powerful political figure of his own, and that, you know, that leads to a lot of the narrative in that part of the Game of Thrones story. Yeah, and it's interesting, of course, this is a very specific thing, the Cersei's walk of shame, as we're as about to describe. But in general, this byplay, this back and forth between the church and the state is is also one of the major things that's in play here. And of course, we all know that's a real thing that's happened in... Um, huge numbers of countries and nations across history. Of course, perhaps most relevant to a lot of us, um, as far as the most popular example of this is the the back and forth between the Catholics and the Protestants and the division of uh, Henry the Sixth battles with the church and Henry the First's battles with the church and all these different examples of, well, I want church people to, to be under the same law codes and the church like, no, we punish our own people separately. So it's, it's very much a power game back yep. and forth. And of course that's also at the core of game of Thrones. So it's a good place to point out that game of Thrones is built on what history has taught us in addition to all these fantasy elements. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about the walk of shame in game of Thrones, Cersei's punishment. She's the queen and she is forced to walk naked through the streets, which let me, is... Let me throw in one super quick thing. And oh, sure. I'll just throw it as a minor hint, and then we jump into the Walk of Shame. Okay. There's a, Speaking of the High Sparrow, there's another guy who may fit the example of the High Sparrow even better than Borromeo. It's a guy named Girolamo Savonarola. I'm not going to go into too many details, first because we're going to go into the Walk of Shame, but also I wasn't planning to anyway, because I actually want to do an episode about his life, so I will cover, I don't want to give too many spoilers right now, but let's just say that the parallels between him and High Sparrow are so uncanny that I really think that he was the model for the High Sparrow in Game of Thrones. He, um, yeah, I'll... I'll, I'll just throw out the episode. reference <laughs> and we'll jump into it because I cool. really think it's dead on. All right. So basically the idea of a walk of shame like this is to destroy the myth of power. You know, a lot of what uh, what we believe power lies. That's a it's a riddle asked by the character Varys in the Game of Thrones. He says, why does power reside where we think it is? It's a riddle about power. He asks if three different powerful men order someone to do something, who do they listen to and mm -hmm. why? And in this, is, in this case, a person who is in a society like this, or really in any society, if you're someone that is revered and thought of as powerful and having a lot of authority, seeing them naked with all their wrinkles and you know maybe a little chubbiness here and there and all they're just their flaws exposed and the shame and the indignity of... of walking through the streets and being insulted and having food thrown at you. It's really hard to look at a person like that afterwards and, and fear them and to think, yep. consider their authority. It, it psychologically, it, mm -hmm. it's, it destroys that. So it's, it's different than execution because of course that person's authority is gone when they're executed also, but it, it's a, it's um, more of a way to punish them while they're still alive. You know, it's just, 
execution is just so simple. Right. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is not so much about killing. This is about reducing the authority, the kind of embarrassing, and that's why the walk of shame, right? It's the idea of yeah. instilling a sense of shame associated with this person to make sure that they will not be able to uh, be taken seriously afterwards. Now, that really doesn't work in Game of Thrones because despite the walk of shame, Cersei will emerge even more powerful than before. Yeah. But that is at least the the stated goal of the walk of shame. I want to give uh, real quick an example of uh, like where does it come from in history? Oh yeah, um, we have a great example, and that George specifically cited himself, which is Jane Shore. Mm -hmm. She was a mistress of King Edward the Fourth. Edward the Fourth is Edward the Longshanks, is the one betrayed in Braveheart. Yeah. Um, Somewhat, you know, not entirely accurately, but the gist of it's there. He was a real piece of work, that guy, but also smart and, and powerful. She did her penance in 1483. Mm -hmm. uh, after Edward died, his bro brother Richard III was someone uh, she conspired against. So he took the throne and he didn't like her for that, for what she had done to try to stop him from rising to power. So he had her arrested and, of course, had her do this walk of penance. Commonly, this kind of punishment was reserved for what, what they called harlotry, which is basically prostitution. Mm -hmm. Because, of course, in these days, prostitution, prostitution was very frowned upon um, and it was punished thusly. So you can also see why, since a lot of sex workers back then were treated really poorly, having a person of power given the punishment reserved for this lower walks of society, you can see why that would really undercut her authority and be, would be a real punishment for someone who's proud. And this is reflected in Game of Thrones as well, as Tywin Lannister had his father's mistress march through the streets the very same way, which is kind of a, you know, uh, supposed to be a bit of it coming back to bite him, you know, because his daughter ends up doing the walk. Of course, he's not alive to see it, but it's still sort of poetic. Yeah, there's some foreshadowing there for sure. So yes, that's for the Walk of Shame, rather powerful moment in the Game of Thrones narrative. A less powerful one, a much smaller example, but nonetheless nearly identical to history, shows up, at least in the, I don't remember in the books, but in the video we have, uh, in the TV version, we have in episode 4 of season 2, The Garden of Bones, we see a torturer nicknamed the Tickler working for the Lannister, and what he does is that with the help of an assistant, he placed a rat on the stomach of a prisoner of war, covered the rat with a bucket, and ties it with a rope. And so then what they do is that they heat up the bucket with the torch, and this makes the rat panic as the metal gets burning hot, so that in desperation the rat begins to eat his way out through the victim's bowels. You see what I mean about every ton punishment already happening in history? Like, who yeah. thought of this? This God. is some <laughs> clearly sick, messed up stuff. And sadly, we cannot blame it purely on J.R.R. Martin's disturbing imagination, because this exact <laughs> scene, in fact, has historical precedents. Quite a few sources allege that this exact method was practiced by the Inquisition in a few instances, in order to apply some extra incentive for suspected witches and heretics to confess their crimes. So in light of this, you can clearly see how and why quite a few suspected witches would confess to being in league with the devil, eating Christian babies and other crazy things, <laughs> because basically they were willing to say anything they believed that the Inquisitor wanted to hear so long as they stopped the tortures. The same exact scenario apparently took place during the Dutch Revolt of the late 1500s. This was a successful revolt of the northern, largely Protestant, seven provinces of the Low Countries against the rule of the Roman Catholic King Philip II of Spain, who was the hereditary ruler of the provinces. Uh, long story short, here we have, you know, the classic religious violence that characterized European history at the time. Again, long story short, I don't want to get lost in all the details. This tension led to the formation of the independent Dutch Republic, whose first leader was William of Orange. What happens is that during the course of the rebellion, an ally of William of Orange decided to torture some prisoner with the same precise technique that we just discussed. And because rats are gross and they freak everybody out, he was not the only guy who think this. There's 
Catholic writers tell that the cells in the Tower of London were intentionally allowed to partially flood so that rats would be coming in from the river, entering and munching on the prisoners chained there. There are some stories of American POWs subjected to similar torture at the hands of the North Vietnamese. Uh, but one thing that we have more evidence on in modern times, rat torture was a big hit for the torturers busily employed by the dictator of Chile, Augusto Pinochet. Incidentally, maybe worth mentioning, Pinochet came to power in 1973 thanks to a coup orchestrated by the CIA and fully approved by Mr. Henry Kissinger, who served as U.S. Secretary of State and National Security Advisor under the presidential administration of both Nixon and Gerald Ford. This is kind of interesting because normally you always hear about U.S. interventions in other countries being justified with the idea that we are doing it to spread democracy. But here is a case in Chile where there was a functioning democracy and U.S. supported intervention which led to the elimination of said democracy so that it could be replaced with a, replaced with a dictatorship. In any case, before we get lost in the disturbing history of Latin America in the 1970s, let's go back to rat torture. Oh yeah, because that's a lot less disturbing, yeah. Yes, clearly. Uh, you know, basically Pinochet's men would pick suspected dissidents and regularly torture them so that they would name other opponents of the regime. And if they weren't enthusiastic about betraying their friends, then rat torture was one of the tools employed to raise their level of enthusiasm. The way they did it was slightly different from the Game of Thrones version. In the version in Chile, they would insert a tube into the prisoner's anus or vagina and then push a rat down the tube. Hey, you know, some people do that. I thought some people did that for fun using a gerbil. This yeah, is how does it go from torture to, to pleasure and just a slight change of rodent type. That's what I heard. And uh, they did the same thing in Argentina against their own political dissidents. In, by the way, Kissinger took a similar line as he had toward Chile when the Argentina military toppled the elected government of Isabella Perón in 1976. So, I mean, this part of the story gets really ugly because uh, this is a, it's modern. It implies, you know, we're talking about the 1970s, not that long ago. Well, I was born yeah. in the 1970s. That's Me disturbing <laughs> enough. And so, you know, yep. rather ugly tale but in any case so these are modern examples of something that shows up in game of thrones and was done uh, by american allies in this case rather frequently during the 1970s in latin america we might have another case here i guess we have to say that the history is beating game of thrones again in terms of its savagery and grossness and we do have the rat example there from the tickler on the TV show, though there is no uh, example of that in the books. He uses different. He's certainly very vicious. The tickler is, is just as bad, but he doesn't use that specific torture. But we do have a sort of a parallel with Theon in the dungeons of the Dreadfort, uh, at the, you know, at the hands of House Bolton. And occasionally a rat runs through his cell and tries to eat a part of him. And he allows this to happen so that he can capture the rats and eat them. And. Yes, uh, indeed. And so. then he's later punished because for this because the rats belong to Lord Bolton. Ugh. <laughs> gross, gross, gross. <laughs> Very nasty. All those rats belong to Lord Bolton. He has no right to eat them. <laughs> Ish. <laughs> okay, you thought that we were done with the disturbing stuff. Hey, we're talking about Game of Thrones and history. Disturbing mm. is the name of the game. So mm. the early on... In the Game of Thrones narrative, one of the other moments that got people freaked out in those uh, questioning their life choices about do I want to keep watching this stuff or not was the <laughs> Red Wedding. The Red Wedding, you know, you have this scene of these people being invited, supposedly by their allies, at this celebratory dinner, which turned murderers where one side falls on their supposed friends and just kill them all in rather brutal fashion. Again, this is not just Game of Thrones. This is history as well. There are a few examples of this. I um, want to start mentioning a few the ones from British history, and maybe I'll take the San Bartolomeo Massacre. Sounds good. Yes, some of uh, my regular listeners will be familiar with some of these comparisons. The Red Wedding is one of the most discussed events within the series in terms of historical comparisons, but a lot of people still haven't heard them. The... 
as you say, there's two Scottish events that particularly inspired this event, but there's others. But the Scottish ones maybe are the ones most people are most familiar with. The Black Dinner is one of them. And of course, the name is very familiar in that term, in that sense. This is around 1440. And we have 10 year old King James II. Of course, this is a familiar situation from Game of Thrones fans who know that 10 year old kings don't have a lot of power and they're usually ruled by their advisors. And these particular advisors were uh, concerned about the growing power of Clan Douglas. And so these advisors invited the 16 year old Earl of Douglas and his younger brother to come to Edinburgh Castle and to have dinner. And for a while, everything seemed fine. There was there were people were eating, having a good time, just like the Red Wedding. Nothing seemed to miss at first. But then the end of the dinner, somehow a severed head of a bull, which is the bull was the symbol of Clan Douglas. So that's rather symbolic, isn't it? <laughs> this yes. is kind of like the music Reigns of Castamere starting to play. It's like the symbol for the, you know, the horror show to begin. And moments later, the two friends, the 16 year old Earl and his younger brother were dragged outside. And this is these were James's friends. So it was it was awful for him, too, even yeah. though. Uh, so this isn't like Lord Frey after it's being ha ha, I got you. This is like, what have you done? Right. And so these two were given a mock trial and had their heads cut off. But the other similar one is. We have a Captain Robert Campbell. This is the Glencoe Massacre. He and 120 of his men were given hospitality at Clan MacDonald's Castle. Now, hospitality, guest right, is a very important concept in the world of Game of Thrones. It's a huge taboo to break guest right. It's as bad as treason or killing your own family members. It's, it's, it's as bad as it gets as far as taboos in Westeros. And this is where we see another Red Wedding parallel, because one of the things that's important in the Red Wedding is it's not just the slaughter of the northern nobles and the northern king who are at war with the south in Westeros. It's most of their army, too. That's which is what happens here at Glencoe. It's not nearly as many men, but you have 120 men playing cards with their counterpart soldiers on the other side, and all of them are in on it. They're all just hanging out with these other soldiers, drinking and gambling and doing their thing. And then at night, one side goes to bed and the other side wakes up and slaughters them all while they're sleeping, including the chief. So combine yeah. those two events and you've got just about all the Red Wedding elements. <laughs> happy, happy tale. Um, one of the, there are many others, by the way, and we won't go through all because we have so many. Otherwise, we turn this into a seven hour podcast, but <laughs> we're not trying to challenge Dan Carlin here. The, but there's one that I want to mention real quick. And again, this is another one like the Savonarola story I was telling you earlier that I will just hint at really briefly because I do want to dedicate uh, either an episode or a couple of episodes to this story. This is the San Bartolomeo's Days Massacre. That one is usually not mentioned when discussing the Red Weddings. You know, when you look online or you do some research about the Red Wedding, they usually mention the examples you brought up, not this one which I find weird because the examples you brought up, while they do emphasize betraying a guest at a dinner, there's no wedding. So it's kind of hard to have no a wedding. red wedding sure. without a wedding. <laughs> Whereas in this case, in the San Bartolomeo's Days Massacre, what happens is, you know, let me just give you the basics. And again, I'll do a whole episode on it. But in the 1500s, there was ongoing religious wars between Catholic and Protestants in France. And what eventually a few of the interested parties decided to do was to try to create peace, to stop the war and create peace by having a wedding between the sister of the Catholic king, Charles IX, and uh, the future king, the, pres uh, the Protestant Henry III of Navarre. What could possibly go wrong? We got a Catholic <laughs> princess, a Protestant prince, they marry, everything will work out. Yeah, that... You know, this is a case in which the result will be such an orgy of bloodshed as to make the game, the Red Wedding in Game of Thrones completely tame by comparison. Yeah. So let's just leave it at that. But to let you know, this is an example of an actual historical wedding that very much plays out like the Red Wedding. 
Yeah, well, I'm looking forward to that one because this, yeah, that's not one I'm super familiar with. I know the, the basics, as you've described, but a lot of the other details I'm really looking forward to. I'm sure a lot of uh, History of Westeros listeners will definitely want to check that out as well. Of course, your own listeners, certainly. <laughs> yeah, so I'm I'm looking forward to playing with that one. We are going to skip on, you know, one of the most obvious comparisons between when people bring up the history and Game of Thrones is the War of the Roses. There are yes. 3,000 ways in which the War of the Roses fit as a model for Game of Thrones. That's such a long topic in itself, though, that it would almost be an episode all by itself. So we'll I'm skip. I'm sure it could you be, know, yeah. <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll just just know that the War of the Roses is a huge element when it comes to the creation of Game of Thrones. Let's jump instead in some of the battles that may have uh, inspired uh, some of the equivalent battles in Game of Thrones. Absolutely. So let's play with... In uh, in Game of Thrones, we see the Battle of Blackwater Bay. Uh, yeah. Want to tell people real brief regarding that one? Absolutely. So the Battle of Blackwater Bay is... It's just sort of a set-piece naval battle in a lot of ways that involves from a high level a large invasion fleet that is accompanied by a land army and they're take trying to take the capital which is mm -hmm. called king's landing and one of the key elements of the defense is a surprising use of what's called wildfire and wildfire is not is very similar to greek fire uh, or naphtha so it's not a fantasy thing, even though it kind of seems like it is if you're not familiar with it. And the wildfire is just it burns green in Game of Thrones. That's probably the fantasy aspect of it. I don't think it, the real stuff burns green, but whatever. That's just the color. Right. The point of it is, is that it when it, whatever it lights on fire is almost impossible to to knock out. It, only sand can stop it. Water doesn't really stop it. It can consume metal and leather and just any, just about anything given enough time. And it's used in some interesting real world naval battles that have a lot of similarities to the Battle of Blackwater Bay. And uh, Danielle is going to tell us about this first one here. Multiple sieges of Constantinople, in fact, uh, fit this, this model really well. Yeah, there were two of them. One in the 600s and one in 717 Common Era. Now, the key participants in the story, on one end we have the Byzantine Empire, which is what survived from the Roman Empire after the West suffered a series of invasions and for all intents and purposes stopped being an empire and turned into a bunch of separate kingdoms. The Byzantine Empire, on the other end, also known as the Eastern Roman Empire, survived the problems that crippled the West between the 3rd and the 5th century and lasted many centuries afterwards. Their capital was Constantinople, also known as Byzantium, also known as the modern-day city of Istanbul in Turkey. Uh, on the other side, if the Byzantines are one of the characters in our story, the other side we have uh, the Umayyad Caliphate. The Umayyads were one of the early uber-powerful Muslim caliphates that emerged after the first Muslim civil war, and they had their base of operation in Syria but they quickly created a large empire that would include the Arabian Peninsula, much of the Middle East, North Africa, and even push into Spain. So from very, very early on, they had their eyes on the Eastern Roman Empire. Some of the key regions that the Umayyad came to control, such as Syria and Egypt, were taken away from the Byzantines. But, um, you know, even before the Umayyad Caliphate had come into existence, Muslim forces had uh, beaten the Byzantines in a naval battle, and once the Umayyads emerged as an independent power, they made it clear that they wanted to completely vanish the Eastern Roman Empire and conquer it all. So they started attacking their possession in Africa, Sicily, and a few other places. Uh, long story short, I'll cut some of these details, but... When in the 600s they tried to make their move against uh, Constantinople itself, the, um, the Byzantines responded by using a devastating new weapon that would become known as Greek fire. Supposedly was invented by a Christian refugee from Syria. And uh, much like the Game of Thrones wildfire, the Greek fire burned even in water, with the exact same result. 
Incidentally, no one knows exactly how Greek fire was made. You know, as you may imagine, the creation of the formula for Greek fire was a state secret under pain of death. So there's a lot of speculation and debate regarding how exactly they did it, probably with sulfur, possibly naphtha, pine raisin, there are all sorts of theories regarding it. But whatever be the case, it allowed to crush the Umayyads' attempt at invading. And the Umayyads were not to be, they didn't take no lightly, so they tried mm-hmm. again in 1717. Well, let me jump in just for a second to say, just like Greek fire being a state secret, Yep. So is wildfire. The the order of the alchemists in Game of Thrones are responsible for making it. They they revere it. They call it the substance, and they are both they cautious, very carefully guard the secret of it. In fact, don't even allow some members of their order to work directly with it. You have to like rise up with the ranks to learn these secrets or even to touch it or well not directly touch it. No one touches it. Yeah, directly. that's I mean, a bad touch, idea. Yeah, touching <laughs> things that are in it. <laughs> Metaphorically speaking, touch it. Yeah, or <laughs> touching things that it is in rather. But yeah, same thing. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so there's a second siege of Byzantium as well where this stuff comes up again, huh? Yeah, and basically it's a carbon copy of the first one. We know we have again a powerful invading navy that gets stopped precisely through the use of Greek fire. Now, this is a case where I really think that I don't remember seeing an interview with George R.R. R. Martin saying that that's where he got the idea, but it seems pretty obvious that this is not a coincidence, that this is, uh, you know, there are cases where it's like, huh, maybe he saw this and he was inspired. Other cases where it seems so obvious. I think this is one of the obvious ones. I agree. It's it's, it's almost impossible for him not to be aware of these things given how much he's a student of history himself so yeah even if he didn't specifically try to make this parallel it might be a subconscious one or just yeah just borrowed a few things who knows but i agree that it has to be part of his his thinking yeah because for example the use of fire there was an episode of history on fire where i did uh, the pirate queen episode where i tell the story of chin shi in the early 1800s she herself used uh, fire boats you know mm-hmm. these boats set on fire by her enemies curiously enough to send against her but she's able to turn them around and use them against their enemies setting their fleet on fire you know that could be one of the stories where you say huh maybe martin was inspired by this but that one the parallels are a little thinner the one with the siege of constantinople is so obvious that i don't think it's um I don't think it's a case of maybe. I think that's pretty definite. In any yeah. case, yeah, if you want to hear more about the Pirate Queen and their use of fireboats, there's uh, one episode of History on Fire dedicated all yeah, to that. It's a really good episode. And just to make this parallel more clear, in case it wasn't in a Game of Thrones, what happens is you have some ships that are just sitting there, and the defend when the attackers come up on them, they're wondering what why they there's just these few ships there, and as they get closer, they realize there's no one on those ships. There's just dummies, straw dummies, made to look like crew, and then the fireboats are ignited. So it's very similar. the The tactic is slightly different, but it's the same, ever very much the same concept, where it's a decoy ship meant to light on fire and spread to the attacking ships, and, and yeah. Yes, indeed. So I think we could probably go on and on because there's so much that we (laughs) uncovered in doing this research. What we thought would be a quick, simple thing turned out to be this monster. (laughs) We skipped so many things. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, we just skipped the entire War of the Roses, which is the probably most obvious parallel to Game of Thrones just because it's so long. So... Yeah, I think lesson number one, as you hinted at multiple times, is that as nasty as Game of Thrones get, real history is as nasty or nastier a lot of the time, where there really is nothing that came from uh, Martin's fantasy that yeah, you I, don't find a parallel to some degree in history. I want to kind of repeat something I said early on, which is that it's not that George R. R. Martin is deciding to make things more vicious it's that he's just not holding back like other authors might he's he's trying to paint a realistic picture he's not trying to make things more vicious more evil more cruel he's just trying to say this is how it is this is this is realistic as bad as it is as awful as it is this is human nature in war awful things happen there's nothing nice about it you know there's awful things happen people get tortured people get raped people get burned people starve this is it's awful, but it's 
realistic. And that's just how it is. We're all lucky that we don't have to deal with these things ourselves. Yes, he clearly has a particular taste for putting the focus on those aspects of history. Because, you know, <laughs> occasionally a few minutes go by in history without people torturing each other. So that's, you know, occasionally yeah. some nice things also happen. But yeah. I'm I'm, pre I'm preparing a uh, a panel for a convention I'm going to. We're going to talk about to a Game of Thrones convention where we're going to talk about the happy moments in Game of Thrones. And I've joked around that it's going to be a very short panel. <laughs> right. It's about three and a half minutes, right? Yeah. I'll sit down and be like, okay, everyone, welcome to the happy moments in Game of Thrones. Uh, there are none. Uh, see you guys later. <laughs> yeah, basically that's how it works. <laughs> no, I'm exaggerating, but it's fun. It's, it's, there's not a lot. <laughs> yeah. Cool, man. Well, that was fun. We got to fun, do a yeah. quick run through, actually not quick at all, a long run through <laughs> the uh, historical examples and right. relating to Game of Thrones. So this was an experiment. We had fun doing it. You know, we wanted to do a cooperative things like this where we jump around. Hope you guys had as much fun listening as we had uh, researching this stuff and recording it. Absolutely. Anything else you want to throw out there? Yeah, certainly. Um, also to echo what I said at the beginning, um, if you all listening have examples that you think we should cover and some other time, maybe individually, or maybe we'll collaborate again. You never know. Um, definitely send them our way either to either of our shows um, or both. And maybe things that we missed or maybe something we got wrong here. That's always possible. You know, you can't get everything right. But yeah, I, like Daniele, I want to echo his thoughts and say, I hope you all enjoyed how much fun this was. Um, you know, you can tell through our enthusiasm of telling these stories that we very much enjoy it. And I hope you find it illuminating and allows you to think more about the way fiction and George R. Martin constructs his works and the way a lot of um, other authors and uh, things work out and comparing history to these things is really fun and uh really illuminating and really interesting so this was great um, i'm happy we did it and i uh, hope you all enjoy it actually i think if you want to tell uh, how we got things wrong or things we could have got right those to aziz he loves to hear how we got things wrong for me just nothing but just ridiculous praise and checks that's more my style so you know if you but that's, what have we done? <laughs> that's my quick note. Cool. <laughs> Having said that, you guys have a wonderful day. Yep. See you next time, Valar Reredus. You heard me mention a convention near the end of the episode there, and I want to clarify that's Ice and Fire Con. All of Shea, Sean, and I will be there. Ice and Fire Con 2018. Probably Ice and Fire Con 2019 and beyond if you're listening to this much later than the record date of this episode. If you are going to join us, and we hope you do, go to the website iceandfirecon.com and use the code HISTORY to get $5 off your tickets. As always, there's a lot of people to thank for this episode. In particular, I want to thank all of you for listening. We always thank you for listening, but in this case, you have the option of listening on the History on Fire feed or the History of Westeros feed because this episode appeared on both. And if you're hearing this, well, clearly you chose to listen to us, so thanks for that. Also, thanks to Daniele Bellelli for this episode. It was his idea, and I had a lot of fun making it, and we hopefully will do another one sometime in the future. So definitely great thanks to him. Thanks, as always, to Ashea for the production and so much behind-the-scenes work. Ashea is the best, as you know. Thanks to Michael Klarfeld for the video intro and our lovely maps. Thanks to Jesse Kowal and Joey Townsend for the outro and intro music, respectively. Thanks to Liet Rubenfeld, who sent us an email including a lot of historical connections for Game of Thrones. There were so many, as we already know from our own research, there were so many, but with his additions added in, there were really too many, so hopefully we'll get to some of those in the future. And as always, we close out with thanks to our patrons, who are the main reason this show is able to exist. The mysterious BR, Hand of the King. Lady Suzanne Sinistral, the learned, holder of the left-handed Valyrian shears called Penance and Hand of the Beard. Lord Jim the Fortuitous of Wars and Politics of Ice and Fire blog and Warden of the West and podcaster at the Two Wage War podcast. Excellent stuff. Lord George Stormsville the Cunning is Lord of the Chiliad and Warden of the East. Cabeth the Unfrozen is Lord of the Bricks and Castle Crimson Light, Defender of the Old Gods and Warden of the North. Lady Kelly McMath of Covington is Lady of the Villa Hills and Crescent Springs, Warden of the South. 
Lord James Tuttle is king of the Stepstones and the Narrow Sea, commander of the Royal Fleet, consisting of the Narrow Fleet, led by flagship Caraxes, and the Bloodstone Fleet, led by flagship Prince Damon. Charlotte Oster is Corsair Queen of the Western Shivering Sea, commander of the Briny Fleet, whose flagship is the barnacle-encrusted Violet Hold Mercenaria. She carries the Naker-inlaid shucking blade, Crassler. Both Lord James Tuttle and Charlotte Oster are students of history. It is part of why they have risen so high. Our small council includes Lord James Inkblade, the Scholar Knight, Master of Whisperers. Grand Maester Saria of the Barrows is Cinder of the Citadel. Lord Robert Jacobs is Master of Coin. Rosie the Clever is Master of Laws. Lady Dyerliz of Castle Naki is the Alpha Patron. Lord Dan of the Red Mountains and Castle Great Bell is Breaker of the Second Stone. Lord Skip of the Velt is Lord of Castle Ganges. Gregor the Toasty is Lord of the Breadfort. Alicia Everlasting of the Greenblood is Lady of Desert Rose. Lord Ryan of Castle Stonegate is Guardian of the Rocky Mountain Pass. Lord Garen de Havilland of Devil's Hand Keep. Ashlyn Winter is the Hawk's Eye and Lady of Castle Skyfall. Lady Mikkel of Moonacre is Leader of the Werewood Protectorate Alliance. The Lord of the Halls of Castle Hillcrest is Wielder of the Valyrian Steel Machete Everglazed. Lord Alistair Whitaker is Lord of the Donhold. Lord Bemmy Snugglebunny is Guardian of the Hidden Hundred Acre Werewood, Dual Wielding Glorious Morning and Little Light Wise. I'm finally getting good at saying that. Brian the Defender is Lord of the Spearfort and the Freelands, last scion of Clan McCulloch, Strength and Courage. The Bastard of Wolfswood is First Forester of the Old Gods, sworn to House Iron Werewood. Listen for the silence. Connor the Dungeon Master is Lord of Catamount Keep and Guardian of the Smoky Mountain Pass. Lady Baelish is Dark Widow of Harrenhal. Lord Sidney Jesse is the Fallborn, Lord of Blue Spring. And Devessa the Twinhearted is a suspected skin changer and holder of Castle Carahel. Our King's Justice is Sir Troy the Steady, wielder of the Valyrian Steel Blade Fate. Lady Jane of House Celtigar is Emerald of the Evening, wielder of the Valyrian Steel Arak Painkiller, Mistress of Sea Eagles and Mistress of Ships. Lady Mai Emerald Eyes is Voice of House Swan, Mistress of Whisperers. Elia of Upstate is Master of Coin. Grand Maester M. Elizabeth is middle daughter of Lyanna Mormont, first lady to forge both the silver and Valyrian steel links. Bold Betha of House Copperhook, still waters run deep, master of laws. Our Kingsguard is led by the smiling wolf, Lord Commander Stephen Stark, cartographer of kings who earned a white cloak through wisdom and learning as much as his skill at arms. Our Queensguard is led by Lord Captain Commander Hama Hellman, the sellsword sentinel. Lady Nymeria of House Seapertle. Alexander of House Atreides from the Seat of Dune, I Must Not Fear, Fear is the Mind Killer. Becca the Bard, Songbird of the North. Sir Eric Redbeard Odinson, wielder of Tempest, a monstrous warhammer. Michonne the Melodious, star of Old Town, Minds Over Masters. And Sir Rambo, Knight of House Ganon, First Blood. Our Beard Guard is led by Lord Commander George the Golden, backed up by Sir Joshua Oakheart. Sir Joshua Oakheart, the White Oak. Lady Rita of the Coppermane, the Unbound, Dance the Fervor. And Sir Jeff, Warden of the AC, wielder of Triad, the multifaceted beard of platinum, red, and brown, stay frosty. And last but not least, the history of Westeros, Night's Watch, led by Lord Commander Daenerys Flint of the Night Fort, avenging the memory of Brave Danny. First Ranger Fabian Flowers, the Bastard of Greenshield. First Builder Patchface, <laughs> First Builder Patchface of Motley Wisdom. First Steward Sir Jurion of the Torrentine, called Pale. Thanks to everybody else. Thanks for all the unnamed patrons. There's a lot of you, and it's wonderful that you're helping us do this. We will have another episode out soon. Blood Raven should be up next, followed by House Manderley, but as always, we'll see. And until next time, Valar Reredus.